Yeah, me and Matt also make ASMR videos together. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the second podcast we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, this welcome to the podcast. This is it. Uh, this is the Mink and the Monk podcast. I'm Matthew Fink, your host. And my name is Brad Monko. Your other host. And we are fortunate enough to have the amazing Jennifer Maidman in the studio today. Uh-huh. So, uh, let's get to it. Uh, what were we discussing beforehand? Well, uh, you, you've been having a bit of time, uh, you know, uh, dealing with COVID, uh, a little bit more complicated than us because you're originally from England. You were back in England for a while. Yeah. So, uh, how difficult was it to navigate the pandemic as a, you know, as someone going between countries at the worst time to travel between countries? It was, it was, well, for a while there, it was impossible. Um, and there's actually still a travel ban in place for going from Europe to the U S which is the U S but it's lifting in November. But the exception for, to that is if you can show um, it's in the U.S. economic interest, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. sounds kind of like that sounds like a high bar, you know, that sounds like a few million dollars, but it's actually not, you know. So for a while, I was, you know, nothing was happening anyway. We didn't have any gigs anyway. So once Homeland Security found out that you played bass, they, right they were like, <laughs> yeah, they were like, you playing with Matt? Oh, OK, <laughs> yeah, come right. in, you know. Yeah, we need you. Yeah. So maybe basically you just have to get people to write letters and say, you know, this is, look, this is a band. OK, this person's English, but the rest of these people are Americans. And, you know, they need to be able to work together because that's, you know, how music works. So um, it's also how the country was founded. Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I guess, I, I mean, I have a house here, so I am a, I pay taxes here even. Um, so, you know, I am a, a, an immigrant, but I'm not a citizen. So, you know, there was a ban on citizens. So uh, it's been very tricky for a lot of people. I say that, you know, to answer your question. I know that not everybody got granted that exception, um, you know, and there's been families split up. There's been all kinds of stuff has happened. And that's, that's been COVID, you know, and I'm sure it's, been the, probably the same all over the planet for that matter. But I guess the upside has been um, everybody's doing a lot more online stuff, right? I mean, here we are, we, we're creating something that's going to stream at some point. Yes. Yep. And um, so I was in England with my partner, Annie, who's a trombone player, Annie Whitehead. And, uh, you know, at first, like everyone, we were like, well, they're saying it's going to just be a few weeks, you know? <laughs> I remember saying those words myself. Uh, yeah, they were like twenty months ago. Three weeks, we'll shut this thing down, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then it was like, eh, maybe not. And um, so we we actually our living room, we we put a green screen up, you know, so we could appear to be anywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, sophisticated yeah. stuff. Sophisticated, <laughs> very sophisticated. Yes. So we, you know, we did some stuff um, with people here, and yeah, all kinds of things, you know, plus remote recording and. Um, I guess everybody adapted, um, but I know it's been tough not gigging because, let's face it, royalties have dried up, you know. So, oh, just as a, well. Generally speaking, I mean, royalties are not what they used to be like in the 90s or, or the 80s, you know. So, so it, when you say that, so that's as good as any spot to, tr- to just ask about, like all of the things that you've been involved in on, um, I'd say for about the last 40 years, would you say? Uh, recording um, professionally and producing and- Yeah, you may, hang on. It might be a little bit longer than that. Might be a little bit longer. Yeah. So a, are you saying that royalties that you have from other projects that you did from that long ago, that percentage is drying up? Or are you saying stuff that you're doing now is negotiated at less, there's a less value, less value to it now? Um, well, it's, it's probably a bit of both, but certainly the stuff that we, I mean, I was involved with quite a lot of, you know, fairly successful records um, in the 80s and the 90s to some extent as well. And, um, you know, that used to used to get quite nice residuals on that, you know. It wasn't like you're going to retire on it, but it was like, oh, that's nice. Right, Just, right. You know, pay some taxes and some bills and stuff. And, you know, I think everybody's noticed that just since, it's really since everything turned to streaming and Spotify and, uh, you know, the rates are just, uh, they to me, they seem to be way down, certainly for, for musicians like us, you know. So Ma- you're saying streaming for the artist is not a good thing? 
I don't. I, well, it's a, it's that's a great question because I, <laughs> I think it's really mixed. Because what's great about it is that you know if if we make a record, we can re release it very easily, and um, we can get it to the people that want to hear the record. But making money out of it, that's a whole separate question. Um, you know, because we're not selling little pieces of plastic anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, except maybe a few at gigs. But I mean, CD sales are way down. Vinyl's actually up, but it's still, it's still a low. It's the music industry is not, not what it was. And that's okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not somebody that just goes, oh, it's all better in the old days, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, there's always an upside and a downside, but I do think that in terms of people being able to make a lot, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or even just a really decent living. I mean, I was more in that a decent living category. Um, From royalties, being part of that. Well, session fees. Yeah. Yeah, you know, stuff that comes in afterwards. Um, it's just not there anymore. You know, we used to get, you'd make a record, it'd be a hit, you know, so you got paid for the session, then you'd get, it'd be on like a, some TV shows, you know, and it's like, oh, it's on the TV show here. There's another couple Different of hundred, royalties. you know. Yeah. And then um, stuff from the radio, and um, it's all way down. Yeah, you know. I think for me, I had a, dis a, a decisive moment a couple of years ago where someone came up to me on a gig and said, "Hey, do you have any? Do you have a CD?" And that was common for the last fifteen or so years. And I said, "Yeah," and I gave him a CD, and he thanks and turned around and walked away like yeah. didn't ask me how much it was like just yeah. was like oh this is this is this is free which is yeah. i wasn't making any money on i mean most of these endeavors it takes a bit of time for you to recoup right any money you put into production but even on a small recording you, there's still probably ten thousand dollars at play like to come up with a, a trio record of originals and pay musicians and studio yeah. engineers and all that kind of stuff and it wasn't like I just I was more stunned, but also like, uh huh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, like, yeah. like, like, it wasn't a, I wasn't like I wasn't personally upset at at yeah. him or anything, but it just was like it was a clear mark of yeah. the way these things are thought of now. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It's almost like it's it's a promotional device. Rather, That's right. It's rather an rather expensive business person. card. I actually, it, we, we both play with Jesse Gross, right? Sure. You know, and Jesse plays with Todd Rundgren, as you as, sure. as you know. And I, I went to see Jesse play with Todd at Daryl's house. And um, I love Todd, you know, he's, he's been, he was a hero of mine from way, way back. So Jesse said, oh, come and meet Todd, you know. So uh, Todd was on the bus, you know, he was eating his, his dinner and stuff. I got on the bus, I had a little chat with Todd and I said, oh, you know, I'd love to give you my CD. And, it, and, it, and he looked at it, he went, oh, that, oh, that's really nice. He said, but I don't have a CD player. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, even Todd even Rundgren Todd doesn't Rundgren have doesn't a have CD it. player. Yeah. The yeah. world is, you know, what happened, you know? Right. Yeah, it's a yeah. very... He very... took it anyway, you know, but I thought yeah. well, it's probably just going to go in the box with the others, you know? Yeah, I mean, at least, you know, in, with him, maybe it's a really nice coaster to put, to, to put his drink <laughs> right. on. Right, right. In yeah. the old days, you could... Uh, you could de-seed your weed on an album, but you can't on a CD. <laughs> so I think you just have to put your drink on it. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. sure many of many a Merlot has been on a Fat Mink CD uh, over the years. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, people give me download cards now, and it's like I yeah. it's on Apple Music, but okay. Like I, yeah, I saw yeah. Dave Attell recently live, um, and uh, I got like two download cards i was in the front row and he gave out download cards for his opener for free and it's like oh this is a nice memory but i'm not going to use the download code it's on apple music right so. right 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 but yeah uh, i mean that aside from like the physical uh consideration of, of what's going on with the music now uh you know obviously a big part of getting like uh the royalties to pay what they should and for yeah. musicians to get the money they need it's going to take some sort of action you know by lawmakers uh yes. which I, I don't think they're necessarily equipped to make those decisions that well here. Do, is it, are they more ahead of the curve as far as lawmaking and the entertainment side of things? Uh, in Europe? Goes in, yeah. Um, there's actually, a, I'm, I'm hearing that there's a move afoot in the UK um, and, and to some degree in, Europe, in the rest of Europe as well. Um, it, it can be tricky to get, to get lawmakers to really understand the difference between, you know, Paul McCartney or something, you know, who's always, you know, 
even a half a percent of of his stuff it's <laughs> like you know yeah yeah um and people like us you know who 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 were doing okay and then suddenly it's like not doing so okay but i i think they are starting to get it and they you know i saw a thing the other day it was like they're looking at um streaming rates yeah um <clears throat> where you know things like spotify we go hang on a minute you know the guy that runs or owns spotify the ceo is like a billionaire you know, most of the people making the music are just kind of getting their little, I don't know, you know, oh, $5.73, you know. I, um, yeah, I did get one check, but my threshold is, is $20. So if you're less than 20 yeah. in the can, you know, stored, you don't get it, but you can check it. But that's, that was after um, 50, 12 years. Of, yeah, you right. Know, uh, and, and I'm... Paul McCartney, I'm sure, is getting He's doing checks okay. pretty regularly. He's doing it, right? yeah. Which yeah. is probably the reason why some big artists have sold their whole catalogue as well. Like Dylan did that, didn't he? Yeah, that was recent, right? It's quite recent, yeah. yeah. For like, you know, 30 million bucks or something. Because it's like, well, you know, how old is he? He's 80 years old. He's probably thinking, yeah, that'll last me out, you know. That'll that'll do it, yeah. And the people that buy the catalogue, the private equity companies, they're just taking the long view. And they're going, it's probably the CEO you know, of Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> he's the guy that bought it. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, I know Barry Gordy sold his catalogue years ago. And I, right. I remember because he had a piece, I think, of everything that was written by the writing team there. Um, yeah. Holland Holland and uh, yeah. Dozier, I think is that. Yeah. And uh, so every tune that that team wrote because they were hired by him and he and he mm. also was a good songwriter. But long story short, I think he sold his entire catalog for uh, for 40 million. Wow. And then he sold or no. It was all in. He sold the record company, uh, the buildings. Yeah. Uh, and the, I think he sold this recording catalog for 80 million and sold the the uh the buildings for 40 so he'll be okay i think he'll just yeah he'll be okay yeah i could be wrong so i mean maybe i shouldn't <laughs> even I, I did read the i read his book uh, uh anyway it, yeah it, it just nothing libelous there yeah it's yeah. um it's uh it's a different world but it's so, a different world yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, and the heavy rotation thing i mean i guess that still is happening but i don't know i mean i'm certainly not an authority on it all i know is the checks got smaller Right. Yeah. That's that's all I know, really. But also a lot of people said to me, you know, there's money out there. There's all these old school collection societies. We should, you know, we don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about money, I guess. But <laughs> there are all these kind of, you know, these Tim Pan type collection societies that have been there since forever, you know, since piano music. Um, and the, some of them are, they, they've been collecting stuff for years, you mm -hmm. know, and they're not, let's say they're not, Maybe some of them aren't that proactive mm -hmm. in seeking people out. And I think that's become almost like a new um, it's a, a little sort of niche for people is to, um, you know, I've certainly be appro been approached about that. And I may go with someone who says, look, I'll, I'll proactively look for this money, you know. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a good chance it's just sitting somewhere. It's just they, sitting in yeah. some bank account, and you know, somewhere. And you're entitled to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a little bit out of Italy recently for the Penguin Cafe Orchestra, and um, and it was just because some society was closing down, you know. Oh. And they and some thank thank you. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was you know it was a couple of thousand dollars or something, you know, which mm -hmm. is great, you know, and um, yeah, some guy had a sort of you know a conscience attack or something. I don't know, and just went well you know this money i could just take the money or i could try and find some of these artists you know and he did that amazing yeah so that was good so but you think well there's probably a lot more like that so yeah yeah well let's talk about some of those albums then yeah if, um that aren't making any money <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah but uh, have a remarkable amount of interest in and all right so I, when i knew i was doing that you were coming here this week um i looked up as you do you know and realizing like there's far too many albums for me to do thorough listening to before speaking with you mm -hmm. and full disclosure i've known you for what four five years yeah um maybe a little bit longer even because it feels like we lost a year somewhere but yeah <laughs> oh, the covid year is that what right. you mean or, or yeah or, maybe it's at least five years I, i'm gonna say yeah 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 i think it was uh yeah. around because yeah. roswell was still we did we did that yeah keep, Ros on, keep on stepping 
right? Uh, you know, you that's you on there? That. I, I play bass on there and some guitar, some rhythm guitar. You're playing the rhythm guitar part? Yeah. I did. And I, I, I just went to Roswell's uh, house with Verna, um, who lives like, you know, right over there. I was yeah. talking earlier about Roswell Rudd, by the way. Roswell yeah. Rudd. Verna Gillis. Yes. Um, and he, he was sitting in the chair and they asked me if I wanted to play on it. So they just played the track ah. and I, it was one take. I just played, there's like the solo on there, Yeah. but there's a, there's a video of it and pictures of it somewhere. But I literally was sitting in the living room. Roswell's this far from me. And, um, is that Re who, who, who did the production? Uh, Reggie. Reggie. Oh, so I forgot. Terrible with. Yeah. Names. Lovely. Re Re Reggie. Yeah. Reggie. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I called him. Yeah. And a uh, lovely human being just yeah. set up a mic yeah. and, and, and it was really amazing to just, I, I went to Roswell's uh, roughly every month for the last three or four years. And I would just go, cause I was, yeah, it was from 2015, 2014. Yeah, even 2013 because I was I was I was I was uh, doing a, a a master's degree then, and I would I remember uh, right. um, doing all of that and going there, um, and I used to just sit and play with him. And the right. best thing about Roswell playing with him is that he's just a joyous yeah a joyous uh, man uh, on so many levels. Yeah. Um, but it was the same look on his face and the same presence, except he was just sitting and hanging and told me what they, I don't even know if they told me what they wanted, but I had just played for maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And that was a take. And right. until right now I had, I didn't realize you were playing the rhythm guitar. Part, oh yeah. That was me. Yeah. Which well, I it, was, it was just a really similar experience. I just went around there and Roswell was sitting there. And so you did it in the house as well? I did it in the house. <laughs> yeah. And Reggie was there and we plugged in a bass. Um, I think I did the bass first. Yeah. And it was just like, Oh, I feel some, you know, feeling yeah. my way. And Roswell's going, yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, that feels good, you know. <laughs> right, right. And then we had the bass, and then you know, uh, and then I was like, oh, I could play like a rhythm part or something. And uh, same thing, you know. So um, I, I don't know if it was before or after you. I've had not... to be after because I remember hearing the rhythm part and the bass part right. and the horns. It was like overlaid trombone parts. That's right. Yeah, and it kind of had this. Um, um, <clears throat> I would say Marvin Gaye kind of feel. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was pretty. It was just a. It's a lovely little track. That it's um. Well, nice to record with you. Yeah, I didn't know that we had. Uh, I I don't know whether we were um. Had we played together at that point? I don't know. We might have done a gig with Jerry. I, I, that's where I'm. Uh, it's yeah, a bit of a blur. It's all a blur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But talking about your discography, um. Uh, that was a fun tune. I'm glad to know that that was both me and you on mm. that. Um, uh, but if we, I, I, so I went back and listened. Uh, I didn't listen to that one this week because I had heard it already a bunch of times. But I went and so I'm I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know who Paul Brady was. Ah, uh, yeah, Paul. So I that was so going back and if we just talk about that era, let's just yeah. call it the '80s. Yeah, is that cool? Yeah, that's what they called it. That's what they called it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if there's another verb. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea if there's. A, it was just the eighties. Okay. Yeah, the eighties. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, Boy George. Yeah, Boy you're, George. You're, you worked with, and I think you did. You did production as well as play on, and also composed. Or uh, you, yeah, I wrote with with George and um, Bobby Z, who uh, was the drummer with. Uh, Re the Revolution, Prince's first band. He was the, he was the original drummer before Sheila E came in. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Bobby, um, you know, Bobby's from Minneapolis, and he he was he was pretty close to Prince. You know, I only know the keyboard player from. Oh, because he has the same name as you. Wait, from Matt from Fink. Fink. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, Doctor. He's a Do doctor. Doctor Fink. Is, doctor. Is, is he a Matt? I don't know. Doctor Matt Fink. He yeah, is that, Matt Fink. Yeah. Totally Matt Fink. Yeah. He used oh, to wow. wear a mask. You see, he was way ahead of his time. He had a mask as well. Yeah, wow. that's that's the revolution, right? That's the that was the revolution. Yeah, okay. So Bobby was the drummer. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know um, that. But I I met George through. Um, do you know Stuart Levine? Great producer. He, he produced I know the name, but I, I Joe Cocker and um, 
Oh, B.B. King, okay. The Crusaders, famously. Okay. That, that string of great Crusaders records. Okay. Southern Comfort, all of that. That's all produced by Stuart. So I'd, I'd met Stuart. Shall I just go, go down this? Go, yeah, go I, down the I, rabbit I, hole. I I'm going fascinated. down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, please. So, um, you know, so early 80s, I was, I was kind of, you know, I was starting to get a few sessions and, and um, uh, I think, I, yeah, I was already working with Paul Brady, actually, at, as well at that point. And, we, and this is all in England? This is all in England okay. and Ireland, actually, to some degree. Ireland, okay. Europe, anyway, it was all in Europe. And um, Stuart, um, who actually lived, I don't, I don't think he lives there anymore, but he lived in Big Indian, which is just up the road from Woodstock. Sure. Very, very near to here. And he had a production company called uh, Olive Olivera Productions, because, you know. Yeah, Olivera. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, he came to London um, just look, looking to do some interesting stuff as a producer. And uh, he worked with a guy called Stan Campbell, who had had a record called Free Nelson Mandela, which is a big hit. So I made a record with uh, Stuart producing and Stan. And uh, Hugh Masekela was on that record. Cause... Oh, my God. My dad used to play with Hugh Masekela. Oh, really? Yeah. See? Small world. Small world. Yeah. Yeah. So Stuart and and Hugh used to be roommates when Hugh first came to the States. Um, wow. He was sort of in exile, you know. So there's a whole backstory to that. But any, anyway, so Hugh was on that record as well. So I kind of hit it off with Stuart. And it was, he, you know, I, he liked my playing, you know. So... Um, so the the boy George thing, I'll, I'll come back to the Paul thing as well. But the boy George thing was, um, I was actually playing with Paul Brady. We were touring the west of Ireland, and because there's no cell phones in those days, so <laughs> yeah. um, it was really hard to get hold of people. Right? <laughs> and, and I was staying in this little tiny motel in the west of Ireland. We were playing with Paul. We were playing some really out of the way places. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a little bit cowboyish, but it was great. It was great fun. It was a great band. Um, Paul's an incredible singer songwriter. Yeah. Right? Um, so th I'm in this motel, and the guy from the, you know, the reception guy, just kind of came and banged on the door and said, "Hello, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have a phone call for you. It's some guy from America. You know, it's Stuart. Anyway, uh, so this would have been about '85, even now. I guess it's like late '85. It was when Culture Club had split up, gotcha. which is Boy George's band, and. Um, They'd all fallen out pretty fast, like <laughs> pop bands do. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, what an amazing run, though. Oh, they had a great run. You oh know? my god! But then, they, then it just did what pop bands often do. They were like, "Oh, we all hate each other." <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so then they, the record company had gotten to cut a long story short. Um, so, yeah, there's Stuart on the phone, and he says, "Oh, you know, you know, George is like he's out of Culture Club. You know, so Virgin have asked me to produce a record." And, um, and he's getting a lot of press intrusion at the moment. So we thought we'd do it in Air Montserrat Studios, which was George Martin's place. Oh, okay. So I'm going, hmm, this sounds good, you know. This sounds good. And he's yeah. like, and we're going to get Lamont Dozier's coming from, you know, the Motown guy. And I'm like, this is like dream, What are the odds that you're mentioning true. the same person that I, I just mentioned? Wow. Right. And it, and he's like, yeah, so we'll fly out to Montserrat for a month. You know, it's really nice. We'll stay in George Martin's house. And he's like, are you in? I'm like... <laughs> I have to think of it. No, I mean, I was like, <laughs> are you kidding? You yeah. know? Yeah. So that's how I met George. And, um, and yeah, the next, you know, I guess it was about three, four weeks later, we flew out to, you couldn't fly direct, actually, in those days. It was, well, I think we flew to Miami, then to Antigua, and then a really scary little plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I bet. Um, and then there we were, you know, in this amazing studio. It's a beautiful Neve desk on a, on a tropical island. Wow. So, um, you know, I was, I was pretty lucky, you know, because, I mean, what you think, well, what, what if I hadn't been at the motel? And, or the guy had gone, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't know that. Uh, when if you didn't play as brilliantly as you do. Well, that's yeah. very kind. But, yeah. <laughs> so that's how I met George. And then we, you know, we just worked together for, I guess, I don't know, through the 80s, the rest of the 80s, we on and off, we were writing. and um, So Lamont Dozier is writing with you? He co-wrote most of that first album. I, I, yeah, I only wow. co-wrote one track on that. Um, I was like new, so I was like... But then the next record um, was not Stuart. Um, Bob, and then Bobby was up to produce it. And then... Um, so we got together, myself, Bobby and George, and started writing. Wow. For the album. And then that became um, an album called... There was actually two that spun off from that. 
high hat and this other one was called tense nervous headache <laughs> I know that was that a slogan here. <laughs> it was that, it was an advertising slogan in the UK. Tense, nervous headache. Take Advil or whatever. It is. Yeah. yeah. So it was, that was the name of the album. Tense, nervous headache. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't remember that advertising campaign, but that sounds. <laughs> that sounds so that's how right. that all happened, you know. And it was just great fun, and you know, not to go back into the money thing, but there was, you know, it was Virgin Records. It was Richard Branson. There was money. Just. The music business was just awash with money because they were just selling bucket loads of bits of plastic. Yeah. Which is probably terrible for the planet, you know, but that's what it was. So, um, you know, so we were, we were just having a great time, you know, really just being flown all over the place and making records. And and that's how I ended up coming to this area, actually. It was Stuart Levine. He seems to be a really key character, actually. Mm. Who um, He got me to come over to do, do an album... Um, with a band that nobody would have heard of, actually, but in uh, Bearsville Studios, you know, Albert Grossman's place. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Oh. Where is that? Before your time. <laughs> um, well, you know the Bearsville Complex. Oh, we, I'm sorry, you said Bearsville. Bearsville, uh, sorry, I'm, it's my my accent. <laughs> um, yeah, so... You've been old... here long enough. Could you please... <laughs> this is why you couldn't Bears, get back in the country. Bearsville, <laughs> they heard yeah. Your, they yeah. heard the accent and... Yeah. No, you yeah. can't go back. They say, Can you tone that down a bit? <laughs> So just, I don't know, did you ever work there? The Bearsville, the studio, like up the hill on Rick's Road? No. So, Bearsville Theatre, of course. Right. Yeah. So originally there's, I, I'm told the studio is still there because it was an amazing studio. Dylan worked there, the band, all these great things were done. It had a, a particular sound oh, that you just... The room was just magic, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Stuart got me over to work on on this record, which um, I think it did come out eventually. It was a band called Lies Damn Lies. But... Um, the thing was, I came to Bearsville Studios and I just fell in love with the the whole setup. And it was all, almost like going to Mecca a bit. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because I knew that Todd had done a lot of stuff at Uto on the in, both there and at the Utopia Soundstage. And, you know, so that was when I sort of went, hmm, yeah, I think I'd like to kind of maybe live here at some point. But it wasn't it wasn't in the stars at that at that time for all sorts of reasons. But um but yeah, then this is the eighties. We're talking. About we're still now. in the eighties. We're still in the eighties. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and I was also working in another band. There was so many different things going on. So I was working with Paul. I was working in a band called the Penguin Cafe Orchestra, which was a very left field instrumental thing. But also David Sylvian Band, which is what how you know David Torn. Sure. Yeah. So David Torn lives in Woodstock. So. Um, I was in a band with him. We did a world tour um, called In Praise of Shamans or Shamans. Do you say Shamans or Shamans? I don't believe in either one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm a Those medicine people, <laughs> yeah. you know. So we did, yeah, we did a world tour. Like, shamans. Shamans. Yeah. Shamans, yeah. Shamans. Yeah. Shamans, yeah. yeah. Sham not shamans. <laughs> not, not, no, that's a... <laughs> well, to Matt, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. Shamans. That's funny. So it was a very sort of interesting and slightly wacky tour in sure. all sorts of ways, which you call a tour that, that's asking for trouble, really. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. all sorts of weird stuff happened as well. But um, it, what was great was I, I got to play with Dave David and hung out with David and we we got on pretty well and he ended up playing on my record when I eventually made it. But um, wait, are you talking about the 2017 release? Yeah, we, we, okay. we, yeah. So that's way up the road. But, mm -hmm. but we we stayed in touch. You know, we we stayed in touch after that because you know you you've done that. You have both probably done that. You know, going out on the road with people. It's it's a sort of there's an interesting kind of intimacy about that process of just making music with people on the road and traveling together and seeing them first thing in the morning. Yeah. First thing in the afternoon. Right. Seeing their moods, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 The days when they go, oh, go, go, you know, <laughs> oh, I just want to go home, you know, and then all, all that stuff, you know? Yeah. And that was just me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, that was a, it was a really, I guess I was in, you know, I was, well, how old was I then? I don't know. I guess I was in my 20s. I was going to say, probably your late, yeah, 20s. 20s. Mid to late tw 20s. Tw 20s into early 30s. You know, when when we've all got loads of energy. How old are you? 24. There you go. <laughs> You're right in there, You're you right see. There, it's all yeah. happening, you know. Uh, I still have energy, I think, but but this is a, it was a conjunction 
it was a time, wasn't it? Of you know, if you had the sort of energy to go with that, it seems crazy now. But there was so much going on, and it's like, I wow, I can play with all these different bands. I'm gonna have to manage my diary a bit, but this is great, you know. Yeah, I was when when you believe in every. It seemed like an abundance of projects that you could believe in. That yeah. at that point you don't have to think about energy. That's your motivation for doing for just doing what you're doing. It was everything yeah. seemed so exciting. Yeah, and just and just really just moving towards the things that that come towards you and that, uh, that have an energy. Like Paul, you know, first time I heard Paul, which was um, I can't even remember now. It doesn't really matter. But I heard his music. Oh, I know, actually, I was playing, uh, I, was, I first met him in Dublin. It would have been 83 even, or 84. I was playing with Joan Armour Trading, who's another great artist. I don't know if you know her stuff. Incredible. And um, we were playing at the Dublin showground, and he came along, and he knew somebody in the band, and we just met. And said, Hi, you know. And then about six months later, um, I got a call from his manager, I think. Wow. And... Um, Oh, Paul's looking for a bass player. And I just loved his music. I just, yeah, great, great, fantastic. And that's how I ended up working a lot in Ireland and then producing a couple of records of his, um, which in a way he took a chance on me, you know, I think, you know, I wasn't like a big name producer. I guess I was cheaper. <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, I was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was the era of the big name producers. And, and you know, the thing is, could you afford those guys, you know? Right, right. Because they were like, well, yeah, I'll do that. You know, that'll be uh, 20,000 a track, you know? And I was like, I'll just do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. no, I'll do it, you know? So I wanted to talk about, so the, the one record I did, uh, I forget how many records that Paul Brady did in that era, but there seemed to be a... There's quite a lot. There's quite a I, lot. I'm yeah. on quite a few of them, and I produced two of them. So yeah. on the, I couldn't figure out, on, on uh, I think it's called Back to Center. Oh, yeah, that was the first one I produced, yeah. So you did produce that, okay. Yeah. You also played bass on that. Yeah, and some other bits probably, but yeah, mainly bass. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, I wanted to talk to you about that process as far as, um, well... When I looked at like, I don't know if it matters to you, but I'm always fascinated by people that you seem to equally produce as much as you do perform on yeah. albums. And um, is there, is it a different process for you depending on what you're doing, number one? And were you writing, were you co-writing anything in there or is this simply a matter of orchestrating the sessions? Um, I wasn't co-writing because Paul's very much a, a, a songwriter. So he comes in with a song, generally speaking. I mean, it might be a, the odd line that's not quite finished, but he's he's very good at coming in, you know. Unlike some people, you know, he he'll have a he's got the song, and yeah, it, so and it'll be like, great, you know. Uh, it'll be a great lyric, and, and he's got very strong ideas about how the harmonic movement happens, and which is great. So, but he was also very open to to, to treatments because he'd come from a folk music background, Paul, and um, I you know. He, he he was a pure folky, actually, for many years. And he took some stick from his fans, and certainly in Ireland, when he started making kind of more so-called rock albums. Yeah, it sounds straight up 80s. Yeah. Like it sounds like the era. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't the first album he'd done like that. He'd done another one, um, maybe two even. Um, but, but that was, it was a, I mean, people tell me, it's hard for me to know when you're really involved with something, but. People tell me it was a kind of a, a real breakthrough album in Ireland. I think it was number one in Ireland for a while. Um, and I think that what we tried to do with that um, was, in a way, sort of touch all those bases because he'd made a couple of records before that after he sort of stopped doing the folk stuff and they they were absolutely rock records, mm -hmm. you know. But on Back to the Centre, there's there's stuff that's... There's actually a, a track called Homes of Donegal. I don't know if you listened to that. I didn't... I don't think I'm... Yeah. That, I mean, that's a real kind of like a folk song. Oh, okay. But... Um, and there's other stuff on there. But it was like we tr we were trying to kind of walk that line, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of... The, 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 the sound palette is kind of, in some ways, fairly typical of an 80s rock record. But um, actually what's going on is is... I don't know how much that comes over, but it's a lot more subtle than that. And uh, it did it did get some awards. I think it was album of the year that that year in in Ireland. Oh um, wow! And um, and we were pretty pleased with it because the, the making of it it did get a little complicated. There were other producers involved, which didn't didn't quite work out for various reasons. 
And um, so I ended up sort of just kind of holding the holding the baby. <laughs> okay. So I think it says on the album, overall production, you know, but I mean, I did kind of produce the record. Um, and some of the stuff I was uh, I was able to do from scratch, you know, and just get the musicians in and just work. And some other stuff was like, maybe a third finished or, you know, even maybe half finished a couple of tracks. And then we had to figure out what to do with that, you know, because Paul was like, well, I, I really like that vocal or I like that, you know, I don't want to lose that. And of course, this is pre-digital. So yeah. we we're talking about tape. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and there was, that was it. There was no, did nothing significant digital at all at that stage other than things like emulators and stuff, mm -hmm. which was a sampling keyboard. So, you know, if you liked something, you were going to use that piece of tape <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and figure out how how to work with it so um so it was a really interesting project and there was a, there's a there's a track on there um i think my input as it often is as a producer is to say um how about doing it this way or or sometimes just well that's enough but there's a track on there that became um it's a, it became a real anthem in ireland actually it's called the island and it's a kind of peace song and it's just Paul and a piano, um, a guy called Kenny Craddock, who was Van Morrison's keyboard player for many years. And mm. um, we we put it down. I'd been listening to some Ricky Lee Jones at the time, who I love. And, you know, some of her stuff would have this beautiful sort of bear thing. And Paul brought this song and I said, that's an amazing song. He just played it to me in the studio. And I went, oh, wow, you know, it's so powerful. And I felt like I wanted people to have the experience that I just had of listening to him play the song. Yeah, yeah. But he said, oh, I don't think I can really, you know, I'm not sure I could quite play it again, you know, or, you know, the piano. So well, let's get Kenny to learn the song, you know, and then all you've got to do is sing the song. And um, and maybe that's going to be enough. And he was, you know, Paul was sceptical, understandably, because mm -hmm. they'd be saying, well, don't we going to need some more stuff on there, you know. So anyway, Kenny learned the song. We did loads of takes. We got a great take with Paul singing. It was wonderful. And then Phil Palmer is a great I was, guitar player. Oh, my God. He I, played a solo on that. And I just, and that's, in a way, that was the production role on that track. It was just, I just went, we almost had a little fight over it, almost. You know, I mean, I love Paul. He's a dear friend. And he, I think he would probably remember this. It wasn't <laughs> like a fight fight, but I, it was like, he was going, oh, it's so bare, you know. And I was going, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's just leave it like that. Anyway, you know, we left it like that. And um and it it was used by um one of the 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 the, the sort of peace party, I think they were called the SDLP in in Northern Ireland, as a as a kind of anthem. And you know, and we would go out and he'd sing that song and the whole I remember we did we did some festivals in Ireland, you know, but late late in the eighties into the nineties, Paul was a really big artist um he still is you know he's kind of a national treasure in ireland and you thousands of people singing this song back you know he just stopped singing they all sing the song and it's it's amazing you know just to to have played any sort of a part in it. i didn't play on even play on it but i felt like i had some kind of contribution by just saying well that that's a great song and let's just just have the song well you know so that's that's a that's a production story yeah but it was very much coloured by things like, I don't know if you know the first John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album. You know that record? Um, I, I should just be... Before Imagine, anyway. Yeah. I, so it's the one he did after the Beatles and just after he came out of Primal Therapy. And it's like all this... It's Anyway, it's so naked. It's worth checking out if you okay. don't know it. It's called Plastic Ono Band, but not the one with Yoko kind of doing loads of stuff on it. There's two. Um, it's, it's Lennon... Um, yeah, I mean, that was a big, big record for me as a teenager. And I just went, wow. Because, you know, like a lot of us, I was into musicianship, you mm -hmm. know, and I still am, of course. Sure. But, um, you know, John Lennon was not, um, tell me if I talk too much, but, you know, John no, no, Lennon. It's kind of the idea behind this. <laughs> is it? Okay. So, <laughs> so you, know, you know, Lennon wasn't like, you know, a great jazz guitarist or anything, but he, he had a feel and a vibe. Mm -hmm. and um, And I think... I, much as I loved the Beatles, you know, I, I'd gotten into that thing of, you know, I was into Steely Dan in the early 70s and, you know, and then somebody played me this record and it was so emotionally raw and almost like primitive in a way. And I thought, ah, oh, okay, music can be like that too. It can have that 
place in the culture of just exposing stuff, you know, because yeah. he was thinking about losing his mother and I don't know, it's not everyone's cup of tea, you know, but I thought it was amazing. So I think in some ways, you know, even when something's more sophisticated musically, I've got a tendency to look for that in your face thing, you know, and that's probably what I, I'm best at as a producer, probably. Well, that's great. I know I yeah. didn't. I wouldn't have gotten that just by listening yeah. to that album. So that's wonderful to hear it. What sort of what your process is? Yeah, the rawness of it, you know, and a lot of Paul's vocal. And Paul's an incredible singer, and um, you know, having the vocal kind of up front, so you can really hear. You know, you can hear whatever it is, whether it's exuberance or desperation or mm -hmm. sadness. You know, to me, that's that's what lifts music to a whole nother level. You know. Yeah. You know, even Steely Dan. I mean, I think Donald Fagan's a great singer. I don't know. I mean, he's I an amazing him. singer, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and and you really get inside his his view of the world, you yeah. know, which is like that sort of, that lovely sort of bittersweet mixture of there's a little bit of cynicism maybe or very worldly wise and mm -hmm. nostalgia. You know, you really feel it because the vocal is so, it's just right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I you know. it's a combination of that raw, there's a lot of emotion yeah. in it. Not that I could pinpoint yeah. how. Yeah. But his brilliant command of of, of language or the poetry that, that, that it, it's a great combination of, like he exudes the emotion of what he's actually talking about in it, a exactly. raw kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a great way of putting it, yeah. The Nightfly yeah. is like one oh, of my favorite records of all that time. That record. And, and, and I mean, I, Steely Dan is so amazing. I love some of those records up there yeah. just as much. But the Nightfly is so like, the, the, the way it's like autobiograph autobiographical in such a vague way, but yeah, it all like yeah. musically, cohesively it like works together. It's, yeah, I love that. I love Donald Fagan so much. He's one of my favorite composers, him and Walter Becker together. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. On that album, there's a, I always sense, I think he might have said this in an interview as well, that it's like, it's, it sort of almost derives from the dreams he had as a young man of what how he was going to grow up or how the world is going to be. And of course it turned out to be nothing like that, but, but there's, there's a lovely sort of innocence about it as well. I love that, you know, where he's singing about, I hear you're into Brubeck, you know? Yeah. yeah. And his, <laughs> dip, <doodle dip. laughs> you know, yeah. 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 And his songs do sort of have that, yeah. uh, dream, like, like a suspension yeah. of, of display. I, I don't know how to put it, but yeah. it, they do have that kind of feel like they could be, they make more. They make sense as a dream. You know how dreams that make no sense make sense when you're. Oh my god! When you're in the middle Absolutely, of it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I never thought about that, but it it, it yeah. does. It does have that yeah. kind of effect. He's an artist, a pioneer. Yeah. We gotta have some music on the new frontier. <laughs> that was the world I grew up in. You know of of um. Yeah, you know my dad's records and like post-war. I mean, I, I I'm a little bit younger than. Donald, of course, but I guess he was even more steeped in that post-war optimism and, mm. you know, the new frontier, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, it can only get better. What could possibly go wrong, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, now yeah. we know. Now we know. <laughs> <laughs> 2020. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now yeah. we know. Um, well, I guess while we're in that area, before we go back to the 80s again, mm. I mean, what were your early influences in music? What were you hearing as a child that kind of formed your taste? Well, I was born in 58. Um, so, you know, rock and roll was was coming in, but it was, it, there was still a lot of... Um, skiffle, right? That's what you were... Skiffle. Yeah. Yeah, skiffle was a big, big thing. I don't know um, what that is. Skiffle was like... Um, <laughs> Like a 1950s kind of punk music was. It was. It was. It was British teenagers mostly. There was a guy called Lonnie Donegan. He was the king of skiffle. Really, he was. I think he actually came from an Irish background. But um, he would take these songs like Rock Island Line or you know Lead Belly songs, and uh, and it was very low budget. The Beatles were a skiffle group originally, and they often had like just a T chest bass. You know, not even a real bass. Yeah, it's a rock and roll with an upright. Yeah. What, so like the early like Elvis rock, recordings. Rockabilly ish. Yeah, really. like rockabilly type stuff. And um it was it was huge. It, it really took off in the I guess the mid fifties. Um before people had you know, rock and roll was 
I don't know, it was happening, but it hadn't really hit big in the UK to the same degree, I think. And there was more, people were more into uh, blues, actually. Blues and um, Sister Rosetta Tharp. And they were actually coming to the UK and they were gigging in the UK. So, um, And then Muddy Waters. Yeah, Muddy Waters. And there was a trumpet player who I knew in his old age, and my partner Annie played with, called Humphrey Littleton. Do you ever hear him? No, but it's a great name. It's a great name. <laughs> People just called him Hump, so I'll call him Hump. He died a few years ago. But Hump, um, he, he was a trumpet player. He'd been in the army during the war. Then he got um, demobilized, you know, and um, and it was the late 40s. And he he was really into, like, Louis Armstrong, but also the whole blues thing, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, it, it was an era of, like, well, why not, you know. So there was this basement in oxford street in in soho in london and they called it the hundred club i mean it was really just a basement it's pretty kind of scuzzy in many ways but there was a bar <laughs> and a little stage and uh, he started putting on these shows in the hundred club and and it took off you know and teenagers were coming we're talking like late 40s yeah. uh, early 50s mm-hmm. uh and i yeah i talked to him about it he said oh it was, it was really wild you know because people were like the war's over you know yeah so they were drinking and they were taking all kinds of stuff and uh and then and then he found like he could get people like big joe turner you yeah. know that they that they some of them were because of segregation were actually struggling a bit in the states so he'd get these guys over and say you know just get come over i guess on a boat sometimes not even a plane and um I'll get you a band and we'll, you know, we'll go on the road or whatever and we'll play at the 100 Club. So Humph was doing that and um, we, this was in the early 50s. And to some degree that became, that also fed into that skiffle thing because as often with the Brits, they didn't quite know what they were doing because because there was, wasn't was really a tradition of jazz education or anything like that. So, um, you know, it was all a bit DIY, you know, and they were just kind of making stuff up. <laughs> And um, I know Sister Rosetta came o- over, who was amazing. I mean, you're yeah, right. She's incredible. <clears throat> and um, yeah, not <clears throat> not really that much of a sister of Bible accounts, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but she was married to a preacher, wasn't she? And she was a gospel singer. And she was amazing. She played great guitar. So all that was happening. And um, what's where that? Where I'm going with this is that there were the people the kids that were seeing these kind of american blues artists in the 50s at places like the 100 club with humph playing his trumpet amongst them were people like eric clapton jimmy page <coughs> jeff beck you know who later formed bands like the yardbirds on and played in those places in and fact, all played with the yardbirds everybody right yeah, yeah you course. know that clip of them playing there in the film blow up it's a great clip oh i don't know oh you got i don't know it. i mean i've read i've read um all of the stories about them growing up and yeah. every month getting these, waiting for these albums to yeah. come out. <clears throat> yeah, and the Stones, of course, as well. So they were seeing these gigs and they were going, this is great music. But again, like, they didn't know quite how to do it because they they were not black, you know. But they loved it. But they loved it. Yeah. And then they just sort of, in a way, they sort of slightly twisted it around and then they re-imported it back into this country. And that's the, that was the Rolling Stones and the whole British thing. It was the British invasion by proxy of being the American reinvasion. It, the, it was really. They yeah. were just bringing the music back bringing in a, back, in a yeah. slightly different form, you know. And even the Beatles, you know, I mean, they were a rock and roll band at first. They, I know they, they went on the road. With, they supported Little Richard in the UK <clears throat> in the early 60s, and they were playing mostly rock and roll covers. And, and then, of course, the rest is history, but, you know, and then... Yep. They, and they took acid and yeah, and, and all bets were off, you know, but, yeah. but that's, yeah. And so, then after that, they all came back as jazz players. Is that what, <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, I think Paul McCartney's got, I mean, he I always thought he was the most, probably the most musically skilled, right? The oh. video of him talking about how he came up with parts and he's singing all the parts. I forget yeah. what that's from. Yeah. That's amazing. You realize what you're, I, 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 you know, I always considered him astoundingly brilliant and just. Oh, uh, he's just, amazing. But when you see him actually just start singing the instrumental parts and saying which instrument it is. Yeah. And then singing that part, like the French horn. He's like, and then you could have French horn and he's singing it. it he's it's a, profound. He's a genius. Yeah. And he doesn't read music. As I, I think because I know a couple of guys that work with him and, you know, when he did those more symphonic pieces and so you get people to... 
Well, then I'm sorry, but where I teach, I'd have to fail him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. F. Right. Yeah. But you know, he's just he's just <laughs> he's just exudes music. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He really does. And, and, yeah. and, and no matter what he does just has that. Well, John too, though, was the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a slightly bluesier sort of sense of sensibility, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul always had that. Is, is it, if I say music hall, does that mean anything to you? Sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I think he's, he had that music hall thing going on, which is also, I've gone way around the houses, but you know, you did say what were the early influences. So music hall was very big in England, you know, which was people singing kind of often quite comedic songs, you know, um, like a Beatles song, like your mother should know. Let's get all up and dance to a song. You know, that that's very sort of steeped in that old music hall tradition. There like show tunes and show tunes, like but that. it was kind of slightly different to, here in the US, it was much more about Broadway shows and it was more, it was sophisticated and it had a sort of jazzy thing, you know, Gershwin or, I mean, no, not all of it, but Cole Porter, it was quite sophisticated. It was less sophisticated. I think that's the Brit thing. Okay. It's like a little more kind of grainy and a bit more. And um, I can really hear that in the Beatles at times, you know. Mm. And I grew up with that, you know, my mum and dad loved that stuff. My mum could sing a lot of those songs. My dad was, um, that's an early influence. My dad was a really keen amateur mu musician. He's been dead quite a few years now. They both have. But, you know, my one of my earliest memories was um, he, he played a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of things, some of them not very well, but, <laughs> but probably the best. He was probably best on the piano. And um, there was a movie theatre or cinema, as they would call them over there. Um, just up the road from my house. We were living in a little house. It was a terrace or, you know, semi-detached. Yeah, they call it there. So, you know, small house, you mm -hmm. know, not a big house. And um, and my dad in the 50s, he would um, he would have loved to be a musician, but he it was after the war. He had to make some money. And he, he trained. He became, um, I guess you would call it um, and he's like a surveyor, but it was like inspecting buildings, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, so... So he was always going around buildings and, and, and the movie theatre, they always had like a, sometimes an organ or at least a piano. And they'd had that since the 20s because of the silent. It's the so, silent movie, sure. So yeah. this movie theatre, he was doing some work there and they said, oh, we're getting rid of this piano. It was a grand piano, you know. And um, he was like, yeah, we'll have that, you know. So this, I, I think I was about four years old and this piano showed up. It's like three guys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you know, my mum's like looking, going, "Oh my god!" You know? <laughs> and it, it, it sort of came into the, the the front room, which was smaller than this room. I mean, you know, it was not a big room. Um, maybe it was ten by twelve or something, you know. And it was a big. That's big. It was either a ten foot. It might even been. I don't know. It was big. It was big, you know. And um, so this thing came in, and it, I'm, I'm just. It's one of those vivid memories. I remember my dad sitting down and he played some kind of boogie woogie stuff, you know. Mm. You know. And I was like, four years old. I was like, What? This <laughs> this is and he helped me, you know, he's like, Do you wanna have a go? And I'm you know, like tiny little fingers, you know. But I managed to sort of do like the left hand thing. I was going like two fingers, uh -huh. and he he played along. And um, it's a really vivid memory, you know, and um, the piano didn't last that long, actually. It was, you know, it was chopped in for an upright, like not long after that. But it was it was loud, you know, it was so loud, you know, grand piano, a small room. Yeah. And the impression that that had on me, and maybe even the fact that I'm a bass player, because it was a low end thing, you know. But the thing is, we needed to have like a dining table and some chairs. You couldn't just leave the top down and, and put a, a, a tablecloth and a I, setting on it? I have it, no but... idea what conversations happened between my <laughs> mum and dad, but, you know, it, it went. And then and then an upright piano came, which actually his mum died around that time, and it was her old piano. She was also a piano player. so And um, and then that was, that was another memory of just hearing him pick out things by ear. He had great ears. Yeah. So, um, and I think it was Beach Boys, early Beach Boys. I was probably I get around or something even earlier than that. Just hearing him sit at the upright piano and 
wow, that's amazing. He's playing that thing that's coming out of there, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I guess by then I was like six, seven. And uh, I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. <laughs> but I didn't get a guitar until I was maybe 10 or 11. I had to save up my, my pocket money. Call it that here? Pocket money. Uh, if we had any money, we we would probably call it that. Yeah, yeah. yeah pocket change. I think. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids had, you know, it's like, oh, here's your pocket money, and it was like, yeah, it wasn't much. You know? Yeah. Now it's Apple Pay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you got a shilling or two shillings. It went up. You know, it was it was graduated as you got older. It's like, oh, next year I'll be I'll be eight and I'll get a, I've got a raise. You know. Yeah, yeah. Now so we're doing anyway, some Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> Bitcoin. I saved it all up and I bought this Czechoslovakian acoustic guitar, which was just. It was awful, but it was the cheapest guitar in the shop. Uh huh. Yeah, the action was like this. <laughs> <laughs> you played slide then, <laughs> <laughs> and and there you go. Eh? And that was it. I was I was up and running. I had a guitar, you know. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Wow. So this is now we're in the sixties. Yeah, we're in the sixties. Okay. Yeah, and the Beatles are happening. And Beatles know. are happening. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Rolling Stones are now happening. I love the Stones. You know. Yeah. They were the bad boys. But we were getting a lot of American music as well, like Beach Boys, um, Sonny and Cher. I mean, even stuff like that. Motown. Motown was huge in England. Mm. We loved Motown. James Jameson. Mm. I didn't know that's who it was at the time because the musicians were anonymous. But I loved those bass lines. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, every right? bassist in that era. Who doesn't love that bass? Yeah, right? Jameson, like, changed the game. It, absolutely. If you take Jameson out, out there's, you know, the whole world changes. It's not really worth living in it at that point. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to live in that world. No, I don't want to live in that world <laughs> either. The D. Jameson world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, some people have tried to D. Jameson the world, but we don't listen to them. You know, that's... No. Uh, I literally said to uh, some students yesterday that, uh, and I just said this to you as well. I, I, I you know, I, I brought in a, a Stevie Wonder tune uh, to use as some ear training uh, exercises and uh, to take ear training, uh, what to take from it, ear training wise. And I basically started out by saying, if you don't like Stevie Wonder, yeah. it's it's you. <laughs> it's not stevie like if you like you need to check something out. I, I i know that's yeah. i, I, I no. am being silly but at the same time no i get it <laughs> who doesn't like stevie it's like yeah. yeah and i couldn't find out who played bass on it it sounds like it uh, could have been jamerson on that particular it was knocks me off uh knocks me off my feet from the uh, songs in the key of life uh, I, I, oh uh, that's that, no i think that's his regular bass player right yeah I'm not, I'm not, by that what's point his name? Okay. uh he's so good uh he's great yeah it was, it was, it's not jameson I don't it had think. a little bit the sound didn't yeah. sound that dark sound but, yeah, had, but yeah, the yeah. feel was yeah it's, amazing it's the other guy oh yeah and no i mean he's like the regular guy at yeah, yeah. a certain point because okay. he's he's on um oh i should know this because i did watch i wish and all that yeah i did stuff, yeah. watch the video yeah. when they had like a reunion of that album i don't know if you saw that but i didn't see that it's like 25 years later and what, they, what a record oh my god i mean there's a string of those i mean that's another nathan watts nathan watts yeah. thank you Shouldn't How could I? I was going to say Nathan East, and it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> but, you know, he had the right first name. Yeah. But that string, Inner Visions, you know, Songs oh. in the Key of Life, um, Music of My Mind. Music of My Mind, yeah. Well, Hotter the man July. that, what's that? Hotter Than July. Yeah. Yeah. How? The man that did those albums, though, did you know Malcolm Cecil when, when, when you were? I didn't. I mean, oh, I, okay. I loved his work. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. And I knew that he was around here. I mean, he had passed recently, didn't he? He just passed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, rest in peace. What Tonto. A, oh, oh yeah. my God. What a lovely genius Malcolm uh, was. But yeah. Those. Uh, he, was a, he was a Brit, right? Yeah. Tonto. Yeah, he was. Tonto. Yeah, he lived uh, right in Sagrides. Yeah. And he had Tonto out there for many years. I, I played believe. it. Oh my god! Yeah, I, I, you walked into his yeah. uh, to Malcolm Cecil's studio, and I, I've laughed about this ever since the day I walked in. You walk in, and right on the monitor, you, you're standing right next to it is the Grammy. I think he won the Grammy for Engineer of the Year for yeah. uh, fulfilling his first finale. Oh wow! He was either nominated. I think that's the one he won. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just sitting there, and I remember thinking, like, if I had won a Grammy. Like I would just buy a big enough chain. 
and put a hole yeah. through the horn and where like like that would be like, like I would just put it in I would just put it in your face as soon as we met <laughs> you know like it, it, it was just sitting there and he had yeah. gold records because he had done so much with uh, Gil Scott Heron and the Isley Brothers. I was going to say yeah those records are great yeah you know, with Brian Jackson and Gil Scott Heron oh and well he had a music company mm. with Gil uh, they did like fifteen albums together yeah. he's another great artist it's probably a bit underrated i think still okay. and malcolm's also yeah. was a yeah. brilliant bassist like right. he was a, like he, when he first yeah. came to the states he was with jim hall like that's right. who he was playing with and, and that's how yeah. i met him here right. doing a, i did a gig with him that he just was on yeah you know and, and was jerry playing drums on that no this was with yeah. um no no, no and i don't think no. there was i don't think there was a if i i don't want to i don't think there was a drummer on that gig it was at a right. library in in rhinebeck right I right. think is um, and so there's probably it's with the brain with brain the way back. they it's the way a lot of great gigs <laughs> yeah. start out yeah. yeah but just because the there might have been a strict librarian there where they did not want drums in the library right is what I'm guessing right right but Malcolm um, and also played uh, upright bass on inner visions the, the, of the, course the, uh, yeah right? yeah that's yeah. It's because the apparently the the uh, the regular scheduled bassist didn't show up. That's was that it wasn't you it, it wasn't me <laughs> okay. no but it, it, it's a great example of the accidental nature of things isn't it yeah it is what you were just yeah yeah bringing it back to where you started yeah it's it, it's like you know so often people say oh well how did that and you, the more you look at it it's just a series of, of, of total couldn't have planned that if you accident. tried no yeah no well, yeah what's your game plan for your career it's like oh i didn't <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I feel I don't know. I mean, you you might you might know this, but it, you know, I, I feel like sometimes there's more pressure to have that now because you know, musical education. I mean, musical education when I was growing up was certainly in England there wasn't any other, unless you wanted to be a classical musician. There was there was there was no jazz courses. There were no certainly no rock courses. That was just a joke. <laughs> um, and and nobody was thinking marketing because none of it had been invented yet, really. No, certainly not for the kind of music that we were playing but now i kind of correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like it's like, oh you're supposed to be able to you know everyone's supposed to be like a little mini tv station you know, how are you going to market yourself and i mean i know it's part of it but i don't know i'm not sure whether you can really pin things down like that like well as if saying that you know it's like well that's a g7 so i ought to be able to do that with the whole of the world you know and and know exactly how to proceed mm -hmm. rather than just going well i'll just keep showing up and you know say yes to stuff and some of it you know if you throw enough mud some of it's going to stick i i don't no matter how much you plan <laughs> that's pretty much the way it is i think so yeah unless you yeah yeah, yeah you i mean yeah. Uh, you just keep doing it if there was a formula everyone would be doing it you know yeah you know but some big corporation would own the formula you well exactly yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah 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 it exactly. just seems like uh you're in the Ooh, sorry oh it's i don't think you can hurt that mug okay um no i'm just the noise oh well too late but we you already know, acknowledged it could be a nice track though <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's it seems like your career like a lot of people it seemed like that era though i don't know if you had anything else you wanted to touch on as we move out of that era but there just seemed to be an abundance of riches, uh, mm. opportunities where, where the um, what's that expression where the inmates were running the asylum, like like everybody, yeah. like that was creative had enough had had seemed to have enough resources that you could get together and make something, and and there was a lot of there was a lot of individual artists who were coming from a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah, um, I think that's true, and I, I think also maybe part of it was that. To some degree, though it had certainly started to shift in that period, but to some degree, the people who were populating the offices of the record companies were still quite rooted in that creative, you know, you know, like George Martin, I think, was originally an A and R guy, and it, it was a sort of crossover. You know, Jerry Wexler was still alive and that and active. He wasn't doing as much as he had in the '60s, but he was around, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, Arif Mardin, you know, all these people who were very who bridged that gap between the business and the music was they were around and and i think that they were facilitators and know, well and it's also you know. a role that's necessary absolutely like to to yeah. give the artist space enough to create 
Yeah, and absolutely. and the resources to someone to have the resources to to provide for that. Like yeah, it was definitely. a respected. Yeah, it was a. Or I, I'm get. I, it seems like it is because there's an like all of these people that you work with, all seem to have pretty s stellar careers. At least as far as selling enough uh, albums to. Yeah, I think everybody was. We were all winners, you know. Uh, you know, they say a rising tide. Was it rising tide lifts all boats? Yes. Yep. Um, there, there, and it, there was that element, you know. It maybe didn't lift them all to the same degree, and some people got super wealthy, mm -hmm. and others were just doing okay, you know. And I was doing okay, and and that was great. I was very happy with that. That's that's about as much as you could hope for. It. Yeah, like, I was like, and yeah. I never expected that. You know, I left school early because I wanted to get into a band, and I was like. Well, you know, if I lost a couple of years, that would be great, you know. <laughs> and and by the eighties, I'm going. Well, this is working. Yeah. You know, I can't even read music really. You know, I'm 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 kind of DIY, bit of a bluffer, you know. Mm -hmm. Imposter syndrome, you know, like mad, you know. <laughs> but well, I'm getting away with it. Um, fool them again. Fool them again. This, yeah, <laughs> some of that. But I think I was also learning, you know, what really works, which is just basically you know show up and play in time you know that's it really uh I, that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty stellar uh description of great musicians show up play in time play in time yeah yeah it doesn't even have to be in tune necessarily I mean, some <laughs> no. of the beatles stuff's way out of tune yeah. you know but just have a groove and uh, and a good song or whatever or a melody and um yeah that's it you yeah. know and the rest is up to some other force that we don't get to you know know quite what that is but um yeah, and yeah. especially play in time right i mean i never thought of it that way before but it is or play with people that can play in time yes it, that's really important yeah, <laughs> yeah. recognize <laughs> let, let, yeah. Let, let somebody else keep the time but yeah somebody's got to do it and of course in time is also somewhat you know that, yeah but you know it when you feel it yeah i mean ringo people go oh ringo Actually, he does play in time. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, Ringo's okay. He's going to be all right. I, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, I think so. Or Charlie Watts. You know, some people, oh. I've heard people say, oh, he wasn't a very good drummer. It's like, really. I've heard people say that. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and um, because he doesn't have the chops of a Steve Gadd or something like that, but um, he was just the, he was the drummer for the Rolling Stones. Yeah, he was. Totally. Yeah. You know, and, and to, to the extent that he was off grid. It was exactly right. Yeah. Well, it's you like know. what we had Jerry Murata here last week and yeah. we were talking to him. And what it, at one point he says, when I'm playing, I am at the absolute edge of what I'm capable of doing. Like yeah. he said, he's in, and, and maybe that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I'm not holding a bunch of stuff in reserve. Right. Like I'm. Yeah, I'm at what I can, you know, and and it, I never thought about it like that. But it's a great way of looking. At yeah, it. every time you play with Jerry, from the time he sits at the drums and just does his when he's sound checking or when he plays the groove on any tune. Yeah, it's time to play. It's infectious. It's beautiful. The sound of the drum. Yeah, um, and the feel of it, which also can bring. I don't know if you had a question about the album. Uh, I, so I did check out this week your album. Oh, Dreamland. Yeah, Dreamland, yeah. In the pocket that it... Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, yeah. <laughs> it's just from the ghosted note on the snare, it just seems like every bit of it is exactly where it needs to be. Yeah. It's got this... Or, it breathes organically and it, and it drives the... It doesn't matter if he's playing some... I mean, he does a lot of different sounds, the percussion sounds on that recording. Yeah, um, yeah. But when he just straight up pocket, it's like you feel it. And for to feel it mm. on um, mm. as you're streaming it, driving the, up the throughway, that's for real. Like there's something about that. So when he was saying that, or when you're saying Charlie Watts or Ringo, yeah. there's a, I don't know what it is. I just know it when I hear it. Yeah. I, I think I felt like, you know, because that, that album was like a long time coming. And Dreamland. That, Dreamland. Your album. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, weirdly, I'd never, you know, I'd always sort of thought, oh, I must do an album, you know. But I was so busy doing other stuff and I just never, it just never got around to it. And I was like, I've reached a certain point where I've seen something somewhere. So it was like, don't let your, don't die with your music still inside you. Well, you know, it's some one of those apocalyptic things. I was like, oh, no. 
I'm going to die with my music inside me. And um, so let's make a record, you know. And um, I knew, you know, we'd both, both myself and Jerry had worked with Joan Armour Trading. He did a lot of stuff with her um, back in the 80s again. Uh-huh. And so I knew his playing. And we'd actually met, I don't think he even remembers it, but we had met um, at sort of festivals and things, you know, just like you do. Hi. He was playing with Peter Gabriel and I was playing with Joe. That's a pretty good impression of Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably me as well, you know, because it, it, it was just a crazy time. There's yeah. so much going on. And yeah. Peter Gabriel was doing his whole big show thing. And um, anyway, so, so, but when I... I was like, oh yeah, I want to. I wanted David to be on it. I knew that, and I wanted my partner Annie, Annie Whitehead, trombone. I wanted her to be on it. I wanted to really feature the trombone. It's amazing where the horn comes in, like right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. That's... It's not a section. Mostly, you know, there's very little section stuff. It's just, I, I mean, I love the trombone. Um, you know, so I love Roswell as well. So, so, yeah. so I had those elements, and it was like. Jerry, it'd be great, you know, Jerry, it'd be great. And I didn't really know, um, We, you know, we weren't in touch at that point, but, I, you know, I knew we had Dreamland. And I think I, I can't remember if I sent him an email. I think I sent him an email, not even saying, can we make a record? You know, not even that. It was just like, hi. <laughs> hi, I'm from England, you know. So it's like Spinal Tap. <laughs> hi, I'm from England. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got a house just over the way from you. And... um. <laughs> and uh, he called me. I'm, I think I must have put my phone number on. I'm pretty sure he called me. Like, hi, you know, <laughs> yeah, like Jerry, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. hi, why don't you come over to the studio? And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. And I'm being very sort of British at this point, reserved. I've changed a bit over the last few years, you know, from be- probably being in this country. I was like, mm, yeah, well, well, that'd be nice. Yeah, I'll have some tea sometime. <laughs> and he, he's like, why don't you come now? And now you know? you're having <laughs> <Yeah>. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that's right I'm like, yeah everything's changed yeah, yeah. so he goes well come now it's so you know where are you I'm like oh I'm just on stock he's like yeah, it's five minutes away come to the studio now so uh, so off I went to with, with, with Annie she was with me at the time we were just there in our little house and uh, we met Jerry at the studio and um, just talked a bit you know and um, he said what do you do I said well you know I've got some songs so I played him a song on the piano, and he just goes, "We should make a, we should make a record. We should make a record." And um, so we made a record. Yeah. So then he was the drummer, you know, and that's how that, that's how that worked. Yeah. So that was the core of the band was it was sort of me playing the bit, various bits I do, Annie and Jerry and David Torn, who came in and just played sort of completely wild. Um, you know, we set him up in Dreamland. We just had the whole room kind of mic'd, you know. Cause okay. That's his thing. And loops and all kinds of stuff going on. Well, I wanted to ask you about because now I'm yeah. not sure who's playing guitar. Because if it's you, I have a bone to pick with you because it sounds astounding, and that's just simply not fair. But I have a. <laughs> I was listening to. Let me. Uh, it's. I think it's the. It's. Is it about a man like a uh, the heart? This man is dangerous. Yeah. Who's is that? You playing guitar in there? The, the solo. Yeah. The solo at the end is David. Okay. I'm I'm playing. I'm generally speaking. I'm playing the rhythm parts. Okay. I've, there's a couple of solos. That I mean, it's it's almost all of them are David. Yeah. That that solo. That's amazing solo. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry it wasn't you because I was like, I was like, that's just not. Oh, even... I I wish. No, I I mean, I that yeah, that was one of those moments because you know, David's very. He's a very, you know, humble guy, you know, he's an incredible player and very, it's very unique. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. What he does. And, and I'm just going, you know, like how it is. You could go, oh, yeah, can you like, play a solo here? You know, it'd be nice, you know, he's done loads of loops and stuff. Play a solo here. Like, oh, okay, I'll try a solo. And then, and then he just kind of, you know, it just like pinned to the back of the studio, you know. Is it as loud as it sounds? Or is it? It just, was pretty loud. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was pretty loud. I mean, it's perfect it's in like, the mix. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah, don't even do another one. You know, I mean, that was amazing. And there's another one actually on the, on the. I think it's on the first track. He did a, another one that was like that. It's very different. It's just an insane kind of tapping. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're. I did. Uh, it's the, fir- yeah, the first. The, track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a sort of slightly pseudo classical middle section. 
But it's a funky tune, right? It's a funky tune. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it goes to a kind of a progressive rock yeah. funk thing in the middle. And I said, can you play a solo over this? And he was like, oh, well, I'll try, you know. And that was the solo. Yeah. So, yeah. He might have a career ahead of him. Too. I think I think maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe him and Ringo could try to get their careers off the ground. That, that's a band I'd like to hear. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to be the bass player in that band. Yeah. 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 That'd be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, well, with that record, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that that first track, that was probably my favorite on the album. I love that oh, funky right. groove in the beginning. I mean, you and Jerry have such a cool, like, <laughs> uh, like lock up together. I, I love oh, seeing thank you, you. you all together and reeling in the years. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if there's something else you wanted to touch on before I no, kind of changed a little bit, I, I was yeah. curious to know uh, what m maybe a couple of your favorite drum and bass uh, pairs are. Oh, that's a great question. Well, you know, the first one that popped into my head when you said that was uh, Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare. I don't know. No. Oh, my God. Mm. Two Jamaican guys. Um, I think they're still working, but they did a lot of stuff in... Um, they came out of that whole Kingston, Jamaica scene, and they were like... Uh, do you know the first Grace Jones album? Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, I do not either. Out. Okay. I think it's called Night Clubbing. Um that that was when they really sort of came to the attention of like the international you know thing um i so them and they 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 did albums with people like joe cocker oh okay and they, and they brought this sort of kingston jamaica it's not reggae exactly but a certain sim simplicity and a certain blockiness of mm. you know just very like big round bass and great simple drums for them i love jerry i love rick Murata. you know mm. We did that show with Rick, didn't we? You, well, the the Murata sandwich, right? Murata sandwich. Yes. I, I was standing between Jerry and Rick. and the, norm, that, Sometimes two drummers is a nightmare, but not with those two because they're both actually in the same, they're in the same pocket. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. Um, I couldn't believe Yeah, that. I couldn't believe it either because they actually kind of, together they make a really incredible drummer. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm standing there and playing with this. And I'm thinking, how, how come I can't hear like loads of flams or weird stuff happening? And there was nothing. It was just, it was just so groovy. And they were actually hitting the drums. It's not, they you know, sure were, you know. <laughs> yeah. And Rick, so, so yeah, I love what Rick did with with. Yeah, when well, Rick's using, and, um, he's using those. He, I think Jerry was using sticks, and Rick's using the blast. Right. The whatever the, those are called, like, like canes, rods? hot rods, hot rods. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the little bundle of little sticks. Yeah, yeah I think Rick great Rick, combination. I have some video of that. Was yeah. that that was the one in um, Daryl's house? I think was it. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. no, we did we did more than one though, didn't we? We did. We played in. Um, didn't we play up in Schenectady or something? We that one I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I saw you at uh, with just Jerry at uh, was it Sky. Something oh, that was the one up in Sky Albany, Loft. Skyloft. Right. Yeah, that was oh, just. Oh yeah, Jerry. yeah, yeah. That was. Yeah, a, yeah. That's actually a beautiful club. I'm pretty sure we did more than one show with Rick, but I can't. You know, I mean, this is what happens when you get old. It's just like, <laughs> even though something that happened a couple of years ago is a bit of a blur. But um, yeah, your your question about rhythm sections. Um, I tell you what, I really loved. I mean, this is all dating me a bit, but I do. I did love the Wrecking Crew. You know, they did oh, yeah. a lot of great records and. Um, I guess it was, um, oh shit, sorry, oh, I swear, sorry. Yeah, um, cool. um, I've forgotten the guy's name. I mean, I, and I know it really well, the drummer. Um, um, the Wrecking Crew. Anyway. Well, I'm going to blame it on my age too. There's the young guy, remember? I, yeah. I can't remember all Hal the names. Blaine, so sorry, Hal Blaine. Blaine. I already feel bad enough that I couldn't remember Nathan Hal Wise. Blaine, <laughs> great drummer. He's on so many records, you would not believe how many records he's on. He's on all that, loads of Beach Boys records is Hal Blaine. You know, um, and Glenn Campbell, mm. um, Wichita Lineman, and the bass player is very often Carol Kay, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. who's great. She was a pick player, and um, I love her bass playing. You know, again, it's it's sort of simple. Wichita Ooh. Lineman, what a record! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just always brings me to tears that record. Yeah, it's it's there's so much emotion in it, but it also feels great. And when I think it's Glenn actually playing the. Uh, the low guitar solo, and he just plays the tune. And Carol's there going, dum, tuk, dum, dum, you know, and it's just exquisite. So that kind of stuff really gets me, you know, strong emotion. Um, 
I've played, I've been lucky enough to play with some great drummers. And, you know, a guy called Liam Ginocchi, um, who I work with in, um, he he's on a lot of those Paul Brady records. He's a great drummer. Oh, okay. Um, we work with, you know, Jerry Rafferty? Is he? No, but I saw that name in your... Yeah, yeah we, we work with Jerry together and... Um, Jerry, Jerry's big hit was Baker Street, which is like, oh, yeah, yeah, you always hear that. But, it, you know, there was more to him than that. And in some ways that song became like a bit of a millstone around his neck because, I mean, not financially, it was great financially, I'm sure. But it's like, oh, Baker Street, you know, it's like, yeah, he made a load of other records, you know, and he was a great songwriter and a great singer. But, um, so, yeah, rhythm sections, James Jameson, of course. Um, who's the drummer on those uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know off the top yeah. of my head. I think I'm pretty old school. I mean, you know, Duck Dunn and was it Al Foster, yeah. right? Um, who else? Oh, Le Larry Graham. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, not sure. Can't remember the name of the original drum with with. Like, are you talking? Wait, is that Al Jackson that you're talking? Al about? Jackson. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say Al Foster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Al Jackson. I, yeah, thank you. I figured you were. Um, I know it's one, one of the owls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Larry Graham was a big influence on me. Um, whoever, whichever drummer he was playing with, those early Graham Central Station records. Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah, yeah. Because he was he did, he'd, he'd invented slapping really. Yeah. And now it's like oh yeah, everybody does that, and it's like how fast can you play? You well, know? you're a killer slap player, by well, the way. Well, I'm. <laughs> Look, this new tone's amazing. Hey, I was watching thanks, the video. Young guy. <laughs> I was watching the video of the um the just like the half hour Dreamland session like oh. documentary video oh, right. that's up on YouTube. Oh yeah, and Dakota. The part where you're just like like sitting like noodling around or something, and it sounds like fantastic. Oh, thank like, you. Like seriously, the slap tone. That was so Dakota, beautiful. um, the woman that made the film, Dakota Lane. She yeah, we were just sitting outside at Dreamland. She said, play some bass. And um, I said, oh, I have to get a little amp. We got some little amp, I think. I think it's a, it's for an amp, right? I think so. I was listening to it. I wasn't like right. Like, there must be an amp. The... I don't know how it happened, but in, play, just play something, you know. And uh, so that's what that was. But um, but now I see people playing slap things that I can't figure out. Um, I guess I could if I really, you know, had the intonation. But <laughs> um, but when it was when Larry was first doing it in the seventies. I remember hearing those records and a lot of people going, what is that? You know, what's he doing? Cause you couldn't really see, you know, videos were a bit fuzzy. And, and then, um, a guy called Trevor Horn, who was actually became a really big name producer, you know, he produced some great records, but, um, I was in a house band in London, a place called the empire ballroom in Leicester square. So, you know, we were, it was a covers band. We were called Xanadu and there was two bands. Um, one was Xanadu, which I was in, and the other one was called Ray McVeigh and his band of today. Oh. And um, Trevor was the it was like an occasional depth bass player. Okay. So I kind of knew Trevor. And then he came, I was working in a studio, I was an engineer as well, just doing all kinds of stuff. This was uh, still in the 70s now, we've kind of gone back a bit. But um, Trevor came in to do a session on something, and um, we just were talking, I think, and... Uh, what is that thing? You know, what's that thing that that guy's doing? You know, that Larry Graham guy. What is that? And Trevor had figured it out, but just the basics of it. And he went, "Well, you kind of go bump, oh. with thumb." It was this basic, you know. Yeah. yeah. And bump, and then you kind of pull, you know, bump, bump. <laughs> and he was like, "Well, I've been practicing." And he went, "Bump, bear, bump, bear, bump." You know. And he said, "Just, yeah, just practice that." So I just went away and I started going, bump, bear, bump, bear. and then I was like, bump, bump, bear. And you start doing different rhythms with it. Like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then, of course, you know, in the 80s, everyone started doing it. It was like, oh, no, they're all doing it now. Yeah. You know, everyone's doing it. <laughs> so I'll have to do something else. No, no, I still like it. It's, it can be great for yeah. certain things, you know. It is amazing. Yeah. yeah, it can be really great. But have you heard Mohini Day? You know, she oh was, yeah, right? she, her oh my, her technique is it's unbelievable. Blazing. She's it's, you know her. I do not know. She's I mean I don't know. She she came. I guess she's a little bit older now. But she's probably only twenty or twenty one now, right? She seems like she's like in her twenties. She's in her twenties, yeah. But she she just popped up when she was about twelve or thirteen or something crazy. Wow. She's from India. Okay. An amazing bass player. Wow. Just incredible. 
What you've seen her on YouTube? Yeah, uh, yeah, I follow her on Instagram, yeah. and she's yeah, me too. Like, her technique is some of the fastest stuff I've seen. People like yeah. her and Thundercat, right? And like they're like I feel like they're just like pushing that bar further and further yeah. up. Yeah, like it, right, like how like blazingly fast, but still tasteful yeah. they can play. It's, she's posted some stuff like in the last couple of weeks, and she's using a metronome, right? She's going, oh, I'm just. I've just been practicing this to see how fast I can play it. And it's like, <laughs> and it's kind of, yeah, it's like tapping and slappy combination. Of, wow. But she she's very musical as well. It's not just flash. Oh, okay. She yeah. can play beautiful, you know, great round changes. She's got like a lot of young players and probably you too. You know? Oh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a fast <laughs> player. I'm yeah. a, like, like, but you, a great thing about, you know, I, I imagine, you know, uh, being, you know, in your 20s right now is like so much is, it's so much is, ac- sorry, I'm moving off mic, come back in. <laughs> it's so much is accessible, which is like, you know, you don't have to kind of, you know, we used to traipse around London for like days looking for records or, yeah. you know, or, or there was, there used to be this shop in King's Cross, which was a kind of CD area in those days called Mole Jazz, because it was like mole, you know, burrowing. And, you know, they, they all want, there was them and there was one other place, you know, if there was like an obscure American jazz record, mm-hmm. there was a chance you might get it there. Not necessary. Or they yeah. might say, well, we could try and order that in. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's going to, you know, it might take a few weeks, you know, and then it would show up eventually, yeah. you know. And yeah, now it, you just go, Junk, you know, and there it is. I was just talking to someone yesterday yeah. about that. The fact that, uh, you know, we're, we started with saying that revenues have dropped because of streaming. And yeah. the upshot of it is, or the upside of it is, the access between YouTube and any streaming platform. You have so you have the world at your fingertips, which would explain why there's a 10-year-old. How old was she when she first posted? The spaces, um, yeah, she was young, young and yeah. there are like even younger now. I mean, there's a there's yeah. another kid I see who's Gev, coming up. She's Gev Devlano or something. There's this, there's this one little one, right? From like Southeast Asia, who's right. who's playing like Jocko solos and Mark. No, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, something like eight or nine, you know. And there's that little drummer that just did did a gig with the Foo Fighters. You see her? Yeah, yeah. She's yeah, like so not, she's nine, you know. <laughs> and and you think oh maybe they're just like. The humoring in there, and she gets up with them a, a big gig in LA. Yeah, I was just, on a huge. Nailed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's nine. Yeah, she's nine. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah. This is not fair at all. But that's the power of music, isn't it? It's like the more. So, yeah, we, I mean, in a way, we're coming full circle. Sure. But, you know, I wouldn't want to be too negative about the royalty thing because actually, in ultimately, I'm fine. You know, money is not my. It's really not my priority. As long as I can survive and i'm certainly surviving and um you know i'm at an age now where the goal isn't necessarily even to make money it's just to lose it at a sustainable rate yeah you know yeah you know so i just managed to kind of get to the finishing line and then just fade out and like you know i don't have kids so you know that's fine yeah yeah i don't have to leave anything behind so you know there'll be some bases and stuff like that for people to have and enjoy you know so so you know, money is not a priority. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Give me your number. Yeah, but, um, yeah, but definitely, it's like that. To me, that's all good. You know, music is because music really is. It's a, it's a terrible cliche, but it is the universal language, and it always has been. You know, any any one of us, we could just show up in. I don't know. It's like with Verna, we did that track with uh, Yusu and Dur. You know. Mm-hmm all in we did that last year i think we did it during lockdown actually and um you know jerry put some drums on annie's on there i did some stuff and then we just sent this track off to yusu in dakar in senegal with no explanation (laughs) you know here's a track you know there's some melody ideas that's it really um do your thing you know and like that's it no explanation needed and that what comes back is brilliant yeah, that's exactly how it happened with Keep On Stepping. There you go. With Roswell and Rudd and because Vernon Gillis. everybody yeah. speaks that language, you know, and, and I don't know, know, know if me and Yusuf could even manage to have a conversation, you know. Well, but with, we can have a conversation words. In, with words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have no idea what he's singing about because he's singing in Wolof. I mean, I hope it's <laughs> not, nothing, you know. I'm sure it's great, you know. Yeah. But we we duet on that, you know. We we were both singing, and um, oh, I didn't hear this one yet. Oh I yeah, it's called I... All In. All In, okay. Verna, Verna kind of executive produced it, so gotcha. she negotiated with 
I don't know. I don't get into any of that stuff. But you know, I wrote some English lyrics and some French lyrics. Actually, that was that was a crossover point. I gotcha. Because he speaks French. That's uh, the that's the colonial language. But he said, "Oh, I don't want to just do it all in French." He didn't. He said he said this in French, um, um, because you know it's kind of colonial. So I, I'd like really like to sing in Wolof. So it's actually a three language record. So wow. I'm singing in English. He's singing in Wolof, and then we're both singing bad French. Bad French. <laughs> Well, I guess African French, whatever that is. Oh, I got you. My, gotcha. my French is bad French. Yeah, my French is. And it, his, yeah. I asked a French person and she said, well, it's kind of African French. It's kind of. Gotcha. It's a little clunky. It's different. But. And Verna speaks French. Did she have any, did she tell you what, it, what, what she was hearing? Um, she's, I didn't know she spoke French. I thought, um, I've I heard mean, her do it. Yeah, she, she like, probably like me, like. Oh, okay. You know, not like. Yeah, she can. You I know. watched her cringe when Roswell tried to introduce a tune in French to a French audience. Oh, <laughs> oh, maybe she speaks better French than I thought. Then, yeah, I thought she did, but I, yeah, I could yeah. be wrong. I yeah, could yeah. be wrong. <laughs> yeah, but you know that just that thing of um, I feel like we could just show up anywhere in the world with a, with instruments. Yeah, you know, as long as you have melody, pitch, rhythm, that's it. That's all you need. So, yep, I'd agree with that. Right. So, you know, more music, the better and the more accessible, apart from the fact of, you know, it's tricky in the in this capitalist system in which we live. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we have to work with what we have. That's yeah. part, part of the gig. Well, it's, it's, you know, great as a young musician to have so much access to things. Right. Um, right. And I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get in on it and put things out there and back on the topic of, yeah. of chops and like Instagram bass players. Right. You know, when I'm trying to think of like, wh how can I put myself out there in a way that's, you know, positive for what I'm trying to do? Mm. What do you think of like, as a, as a, if you're just trying to put content online mm. as a bassist, how do you like, like, not that you even need to do this at this point, but for like a younger player, like how should they navigate like I'm, I'm making a video to showcase the bass, but right, the bass is kind right. of meant to be in the background. So I'm always fighting in my head, like, right. should I try to make this part complicated or should I try to make it as simple as possible? And That's I feel like question. I'm making overcomplicated things as like an etude for myself. But right. then I feel like people are going to watch that and they're going to be like, this bass player is too busy. Like, this is not necessary. Right. That's a really good question. I think it depends. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I've already said you can't really make plans, but... I mean, I guess you, you know, like anybody, you have, you have your, you have your taste, you know, and you have the things that you love and, and I mean, I, I think, I think if you do what you love, I mean, I know that sounds like maybe that almost seems like a cop out answer, but I think that that comes over. I think, I think if it comes from a place of, um, it's almost starting to get into something spiritual. I don't mean religious. I don't mean in that sense, but like something that has real spiritual integrity because the thing is there's you know yourself you know i go on instagram as well there are there's a thousand or ten that i god knows how many bass players there are kind of going there's a there's a feed called bass play universe or something and it's yeah, like yeah. you can you can pay them you know and they feature you and all these bass players and they're all great you know they're all amazing and it's like uh, uh you know <laughs> but um but how about like who was the guy who played with Bob Marley? Um, family Man, right? Aston Family Man Barrett. You know him? I, no, not well. I think I was literally just talking about someone with them the other day. Um, yeah. But but a great bass player. Super simple. I mean, boom, 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 boom. boom, 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 boom you know, like the simplest things, but it's like it's got so much integrity. And... um. I think if you find whatever that is for you as an individual, that's the thing, you know, for Larry Graham, it was like being big and funky. And, you know, I saw him play in a small club in London one time and he came out in his white suit, you know, with his white bass. And he was like, you know, wireless, which was not everyone had that in those days and just slapped the shit out of that thing, you know. <laughs> and it was like, well, he's doing him. Yeah, yeah. You know. And even by that point, you, you know, there was en enough people around like Stanley Clark. You, you could go, he might not even have the best chops of any bass player, but he is definitely him. You know, he is the real deal, you know. And, and I feel like even more so now that that there is, it's all, we're in, inundated with everything. You know, there's, 
It's almost like it's too much. Um, I, I, I might be. I hope I'm right. I don't really know, but that's my instinct: is that integrity will always kind of cut through in some way. Well, that's what I, I definitely care about more than chops. Is right? I mean, obviously, I want to keep working on my chops, but yeah. having a sound and having just opinions about what I actually like. You know, I'd right. rather ask myself, yeah. "Do I like this more than is this flashy?" Right. I don't want to be flashy. I want to. I yeah. want to play a sound that it represents what I like. Yeah. Um, Exactly. If, and this kind of transitions into uh, something else I wanted to ask you, because um, the bassist that I like resonates with me the most, that is, is just my favorite of all time, actually uh, passed away this year, the great Paul Jackson. Oh, um, great I, bass player. Um, and I wasn't sure if you had any uh, personal opinions on. on I his loved playing his playing. Yeah. I mean, he was on. great bass player and so beautifully understated sometimes. Um, yeah, that's a gr- Great. He, he's on the Nightfly, isn't he, on some of those tracks? The Nightfly? Uh, no, him? I know no. Marcus Miller's on the Nightfly, Marcus which I, I love those I thought tracks. he might have played on... Um, I mean, who else is on Nightfly? Ruby. Like Anthony Jackson Maybe. or someone? I, I don't think it's Paul Jackson. He's no. not Paul Jackson, okay. Um, Maybe I'm thinking of Anthony, yeah. But, I, I, yeah, he's great. I mean, he's just great. I, I didn't know he'd passed, actually. Yeah, so earlier this that. year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, him and him and uh, Mike Clark together. Um, yeah, Clark, yeah, like headhunter stuff, and that, that's what gets me thinking about asking uh, rhythm yeah. section players who their favorite rhythm section is. Because for me, like as far as that like, was a great rhythm funk, section, funk players go yeah, like yeah. that's like I love that. that stuff. That's a that's a great example because in a way they were also I feel like they were they were great together is one thing, but also they were almost like inventing it as they went along. Yeah. It was like oh, we're inventing a new kind of music. You know, that nobody's ever really quite heard before, just like Larry was with Graham Central Station or Sly, you know, when it was like, oh, my God, you know. And actually, if you analyse it, um, some of that stuff, it's, I mean, they're, they're great chops, but technically not sort of perfect, you know, like in, you know what I mean? Like maybe the tempo goes up a bit or down, like things did in those days, but it just feels so good and it's yeah. so inventive and it's so fresh. I mean, that's the tricky thing now, I suppose. It's just like really finding what's fresh, right? But but good music's always fresh. Maybe. I don't know. I hope it is. Well, yeah. a lot of musicians now have access to getting something. You have, you can put something out there yeah. cheaper now than it used to be. Right. So there is a, you can just discover something that you've never heard of and... and, and yeah. Yeah. And you know what? It can be something. I tell you what, you know, you're talking about the film, Dakota, who made that film. She's not a musician, um, but she, she, she's, she's quite into sort of lo fi stuff. You know, I don't know if you've gotten into that. I, I was really unaware of it. And do you know what lo fi no. is? No. Yeah, it's like, it's like music that kind of, where, where things are kind of deliberately sort of somewhat degraded. <laughs> oh. And it's sort of the sound, sonically, you know. And and it appeals to me because I'm really into like things like old phonographs and you know I I love get going back to the source of like Louis Armstrong so I've got that sort of connection with the idea of lo-fi as a thing and growing up with tube tube equipment and you know and I heard some of some of it I just this is great you know and uh, it's not even like players necessarily but it's fresh it's somebody bringing a fresh perspective mm-hmm. and saying well how about this. How about this? You know, how about we deliberately mess it up? You know, but it still grooves. You know, it's not. It's not just. It's not bad playing. It's just. It's just. Um, All those mistakes that I make on the reel-in gigs, deliberate. You're a lo-fi guy. <laughs> I'm a lo-fi guy. <laughs> yeah, it's all on purpose. I plan them out. But I don't and, know. and tomorrow night, yeah, completely different mistakes. Right. They're, they're not, I don't repeat myself with that. You're so innovative. I'm so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're playing tomorrow night. We yeah, are playing tomorrow night. To that, yeah. This won't come out, though, for a little bit. So, so it won't be tomorrow night. It won't be tomorrow night. But yeah. it will be tomorrow night. Yeah. In this realm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, just looking for. Just be yourself. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think I just got pretty lucky. I, I do, honestly, you know, or fortunate. Maybe fortunate is a better word because I think lucky always has a slight connotation of like, Ugh, you know, you just got lucky. Yeah, but if it happens as many times as it happened with you, 
that's not luck anymore. I mean, you might, you can get lucky once, but if you can't live up to what the expectations are, you won't, you probably won't get lucky again. And you got That's lucky, true. what, 250, 300 times as I far as- I made a lot of records, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, a lot of that is also just, got, I mean, that's, we haven't touched on that at all, but is, you know, being able to just get along with people. Because, you know, especially in those days, studios, there's a real hot house atmosphere. And quite often there was, Although there was money swilling around the business, like we said, it was also like there was could be a lot of money riding on a on an album, you know, mm -hmm. like a Boy George record, you know. It's like the record companies going, they would kind of leave you to it because I think there was a certain level of respect for the artists, but at the same time they're like occasionally remind you that they were spending whatever it was, you know, half a million or a million. You know, I don't yeah. know. I mean, no, but I can't even remember. But judging on the kind of money that was around, it was pretty, the budgets were big, you know, and studios were expensive. And so um, it was important to be able to just get on, get along with people, you know, handle a certain amount of, I don't know, just it's almost like tunnel vision, isn't it? You know, not let that get to you. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and particularly if you were in that producer role, which I, sometimes I was, sometimes I wasn't. But to to, to just see that space as kind of, it might sound a little pompous, but almost to see it as like sacred. And it, it, you know, it makes me think of what you said about what Jerry said when he shows up to play. It is almost like it's a sacred thing. You of know, course it is. I'm playing. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I think if you bring that, then you're, you're, you're more than halfway there already. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm not just messing about. This is, this is music, you know. Yeah, there's deep meaning behind yeah. what you're doing. This is actually, emotional meaning and, right? and yeah. You know, when I was when I was 16 years old, I had a manager, um, a guy called Jimmy Winston. He passed recently. He was. At, do, you, do you remember the band called the Small Faces? I do not. No. Okay, they were a big band. Um, the singer was Steve Marriott, who went on to form Humble Pie. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they were a big, big band in the states. But originally, they were called the Small Faces, and out of that came the Faces, which was Rod Stewart and all those guys. So they were like they were a local band where I was growing up in East London. So Jimmy Winston was the original keyboard player. And then he kind of didn't really want to be in bands anymore. He became, went to management. But um, he was my first manager. Um, I was in a band and he got us gigs in London. We weren't just kids, you know, 16, 17. But he gave me this book and it was called Music Simple mm -hmm. by a guy called Sufi Inyat Khan, who was a mystic. Okay. Know? And I still have that book. And... and um, I don't often think about it and I hadn't thought about it for probably years. And I just thought about it and, and it, I think it was, it, he was kind of going, he was, he was, he had that spiritual perspective, Jimmy, you know, and he, it was like, just so you know, <laughs> you know, you're six, I was 16. Just so you know, this is what you're getting into, you know, mm. it's not, it's not just froth, <laughs> you know, it's not just pop music. This is, this is, you know, and this book was about, it was all this, a lot of it went over my head. It's like the music of the spheres and how the universe works and, you know, no. very yeah. esoteric stuff. But I think it was, some of it went in and I'd still believe that. I think music is actually, despite how things appear to be, which is a whole nother story, you know, we're looking at all this bullshit going on, you know, and politics and money and all the rest of it. Um, ultimately, um, music is actually... It's a, it's a sort of manifestation of the most powerful force in the universe, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it's frequencies. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Everything's kind and of And especially bass, right? It's all yeah. frequencies. That's what the book's about. It's saying, well, it's all just, you know, it's frequencies. It's just things spinning and, you know, and that's what we do. You know, you pick up a bass and you go, boom, you know, whatever, you know, 220 yeah. cycles. Well, every time the Earth goes around the sun, that's a frequency. Like, right. like the, the universe, like is humming. Like people will say things like that, and it is very like yeah. hippy dippy. But it really and, is. But it, yeah, but it like makes sense to a certain level. It's just kind of like how things yeah. function, and it, it, I guess that right. just boils down to like how people can understand each other through music. It's like you're saying. Yeah. With, um, you probably couldn't even have a conversation with. Uh, oh, I, I already. Lost you see, yeah. But yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But musically, there's there's still a connection there, and there's something to be yeah. said, and there's something you yeah. feel in each other that you can kind of. And it, and it probably predates verbal language. I, w I would, I would, I don't know whether they know that or not, but I would imagine so. You know, because birds sing and animals make noises and pitch and rhythm, and 
you know, that's all there in nature. We have these pigeons in England where we live in England and they they make this great rhythm, you know, boo, 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 boo. And they all do it, you know, all these pigeons. Except there was one last year, we had one syncopated pigeon. Oh. And it went boo, 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 And it's like, and this year I was like, I hope that pigeon comes back. It didn't come back. You have a ragtime pigeon. Yeah, that's right. Well, Ragtime pigeon. That's rag. a that's a good name for a prog band. I think you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, well, absolutely, all of that stuff. Yeah, it's all it's all rhythm and cycles and and that's all we are as well. We think we're these. Um, where I'm, shall I go there? You can go there. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, what what is a human being? I mean, we just we just coalesced out of this universe, haven't we? Mm. You know, for a brief period and and we're each we're just the universe looking looking in on itself we're not we're not apart from it you know that's the way i look at it so how could i not be in tune with that how so i'm god basically oh now we're getting to it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sorry, okay if you, if you, <laughs> you, make too big of a no no, no well nobody. yeah if you like i mean we're, 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 <laughs> if you're we're, into that sort of thing yeah yeah we all i think that we all are i think that that underneath all the again all the all the sort of stuff that gets written and you know words that are written i mean of course this is just words isn't it but um i think that's probably what most ancient religions were trying to get at you know and the sufis certainly you know who who are the ones that well get in a trance whirling dervishes i don't know what religion that is it might be sufis but they whirl they just you know, it's uh, it's a way to get out of it. I basically. don't know about that. I mean, Christian McBride has a beautiful t- tune called "Whirling Dervish." I know that. Oh, okay. Oh, we've never seen a whirling dervish. No. Yeah. So they were. It's basically it's like when you know kids do it instinctively. You know, they, did you ever do that as a kid? You you spin around spin, to try and get yeah, dizzy, yeah, 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 yeah. and it's like, oh, it's funny, you know. And uh, I think that that's a really primal impulse is to, um, is to do that is to get out of your self, out of your self obsession. The idea of that we're just these little atomized little sort of units of biology and we are that but we also not that you know because if we were then it's like well what happens when somebody's asleep or what happens if somebody is injured and you know they they don't function anymore and they say oh they're in a vegetative state well they're still alive so what do you call that thing that's gone away you know Mm. um and uh, it's music to me, you know, or it certainly is part of it. Music is a great way to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what was it? Time's up. Yeah. Yeah. Come in. Come in, number 42. Your time is up. <laughs> um, yeah, I think music references that at, at the very least, but maybe more than that, music is an expression okay, yeah. of that. I think. I, I, I think when I discovered bass, which was, pro- I was about 12. I mean, when I first got my first bass, my mum bought me a bass. Um, it was a, J- a Jetson short scale bass. And um, I was really struck by the, the vibrational aspect. That's what got me about it. It was like, okay, all this other stuff's great, and it is great, and I know that's vibration too, but this thing, I can actually make stuff <laughs> literally vibrate. I can make people vibrate, you know, that's you know don't want to get too <laughs> too porno here, oh. <laughs> um, but you know that's that was very appealing to me as a as a as a twelve year old and and then I started listening to, I'm sure you did if you're into bass you know I started listening to the low end of stuff those old tube gramophones and radios were great for that as well they yeah. they always had that really warm bottom end and um, listening out for it's like um, what's that song I'll be there. It's, it's, a, it's like a two-bar bass fill before the chorus hits on that, and it's, it's James done. Boom, bim, boom, bim, boom, bim, bim, boom. It's just this beautiful thing, you know. It's like, oh, what's that, you know? And the and the way it vibrates, it you, you gets your molecules going. So, um, yeah, that that yeah. <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah, like I said, it's it's very uh, esoteric. It's I, esoteric. I, I, I really, like I I feel it. It's just it's, right. it's so abstract, but it's like it is part of how I kind of connect with. You feel it, right? That's yeah. like the most religious part. Like, I'm not a religious guy, but the way I no, me neither, connect yeah. with just the way things flow in the universe, it yeah. kind of relates to yeah. that. Well, I, I feel like re- religions were, were, in a way, a lot of them to me, um, 
uh, somebody might really hate this, but you know, in a way, we're supposed to have that direct experience of the universe, and and religions are like franchises where these kind of people came along and went, yeah, we'll help you with that. You know, we'll we'll just get in there and um, you know, give us a little cut there, and you know, put some <laughs> money in that dish or whatever it is. And um, I mean, they literally used to sell. That that was a big thing in Europe, wasn't it? We've gone way off music, but um, I forget which church it was. It was a big fallout in Europe in like the 15th century, and it was because the church was kind of selling. It was like selling insurance. They were they were like, if you pay this much, you'll definitely get to heaven. I, think I remember hearing about this in yeah. school or something. Yeah. yeah, and there was and there was a guy who split off and formed a whole other church, and he said, "This is just corruption." Pay you know, me instead. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he said it's free. He was like, oh, you know, okay. it was like you can get into heaven free now. And probably somebody killed him, you know, shortly after he said that. But, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but you can via music and bass or guitar or whatever. You know, to me, that is, you know, that's the door to heaven. I think. I think it's just all around us. It's music, you know. Well, yeah. If you can um, touch somebody for with without getting arrested for it like if you can t t if you can <laughs> if you can um play music yeah. and i mean i know that I, I when i look out over an audience um and they're singing along to what you're playing and they feel good and they come up afterward and tell them tell you how good you just made them feel yeah doesn't get better right it does not and i also don't feel compelled to look to an outside source to define what that is i intuitively right. that's that's right to me yeah and yeah. i don't need that to be verified no you feel it you feel, you it. feel it yeah I yeah know. so i guess that's we've brought this full circle many times at this point but mm. at all of the things that i listened to this week um that had you on it you can feel all of them Oh, well, that's that beautiful. Thank you. That's I didn't listen to, if I'm being completely honest, I didn't get to all 200 and, and however. <laughs> you didn't listen to everything I ever did? I didn't listen to everything, but I literally pulled, just <laughs> picked some random things. Uh, and luckily, yeah. I started with uh, Dreamland. Right. You know, um, it, it just made me realize, like, I've been playing with you probably since that album first came out. Yeah. And I had never thought to just go on Spotify and look you up <laughs> right right <laughs> or go on whatever yeah uh, yeah so i was like all right jennifer's coming over let Aww. me do a little uh let me just check out something because i know how you play i've played with you i was thinking about the different experiences that i've had with you um one of the funnest too they're all were fun but the secret uh the secret city uh, oh yeah the secret city that stuff um fun. so you're that um I'm sorry. What's his name? I'm Chris Wells. Chris Wells. The, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris is great. Chris is amazing. Mm. Um, that performance, that was Jerry as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm forgetting the other man who played guitar and sang the George Michael the Faith. Oh, Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy Faith. Bass. Yeah. There. We're bringing up. There's yeah, Faith yeah. again. This is all yeah. coming. Um, but again, an audience of people. Uh, completely enthralled with what was happening. Yeah. Having a good time. Yeah. And it also made me realize, like, looking up your discography was your, you've done everything, production, performance, but you've also done acting, right? And you've- I did a bit of acting, yeah. 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 So it's like yeah. your, your whole life seems to be uh, lived as one who, not in a bad way, Touches. Just one big performance. Yeah, well, but, but, but you're constantly <laughs> yeah. touching people and oh. reminding them of the beauty of what all of the... Because, yes, you play music, but acting is its own music, I suspect. Mm. Um, mm. It's another way of relating to the world uh, and, and, and actually having a positive effect. Uh, I, I mean, I love... Invisible, yeah. whatever you want to call it. True. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I wouldn't call myself an actor by any degree, but I, I've done a bit... But um, and I I wouldn't call, think of myself as a, as a as a good actor even. But uh, I I mean a great actor can you know touch people in un unbelievable ways. And so you know I admire that because it's like wow they don't even have an instrument. You know yeah. they're not even singing. 
But well, if you want to get uh, annoying about it, you could say their body was their instrument. But. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, no, absolutely, yeah. I, but I, I'm just telling yeah. you that if the conversation yeah. starts yeah. with somebody saying that, I'm I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it's actually true because is, you know it's absolutely true. I'm what is I'm an still instrument? Out. I'm no. still out. I'm walking. No, let's go there. No, it's a great question. What do we mean by an instrument? You know, they just evolved to be things with strings or whatever, but. It's again. It's just. It's Vessel. just. It's a yeah. It's yeah. a vehicle, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anything can be a vehicle, and and what what is it a vehicle for? It's that. It's like well, you know, we're here. We're here now. You know, don't waste it. Yeah, it's <laughs> you know? a reminder of how beautiful. Yeah, life, things can life. actually be. Yeah, so much far far better than a lot of the negative things you can get caught up in on a daily basis, especially if you're yeah. inundated with just horrible things in your for lack of a better word in your feed you know well again there's plenty of opportunities for that now there's 24 hour bad things yeah you have to make a choice in what to participate in and yeah. you, you have yeah. to make a choice you you are making a I, choice i think so otherwise yeah. you go crazy it's, yeah. it's a tricky one though isn't it because you know i, I want to know what's going on out there mm -hmm. so so that i can engage with it in a meaningful way but i don't want to be saturated with crazy stuff yeah <laughs> and and let's right. face it that it's yeah. crazy stuff. It's crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's better to do probably more rewarding to do the yeah. the projects that you've been yeah. involved in to to put something positive out into the world and receive something positive back for that endeavor. Yeah. And and maybe sometimes there's an element of trying to sort of absorb I mean I think this is probably um I, you know, I'm but no, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not anyist. But I, I think part, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there's any Buddhists listening, but that, you know, the idea of sort of transforming as well can be part of creativity is like, because there is crazy stuff and there mm. is, um, you know, lack of compassion and mm. all, there's all that, there is all that dark stuff that, that uh, the Buddhist thing is that you, you can transform that, you know, but not if you, not if you're sort of attached to it and you're stuck in it. Yeah. You know, but it can kind of transform, and then you put that out. And you know, I look at someone like the Dalai Lama, who I know nothing about Buddhism at all, but he seems like a pretty cool guy to me. He seems to exude kindness and compassion without having to have a guitar or a bass. You know, yeah. <laughs> does he have an Instagram? <laughs> I, I think he probably does. <laughs> does he but you know, he's just like this kind of guy that just moves around the world, just kind of shining this sort of glow yeah. around you know yeah. so you know that's the kind of a music i think well it's exactly what you're doing in music you know yeah. you're going around the world yeah and you're shining a, a light on what can be beautiful and anything that you touch when you're shining that light turns to that that's beautiful well you're welcome again you can keep that name i came up with earlier and i don't remember what it was and, and what i just said as well <laughs> i can't remember what it was what was the name it was you said it could have been a band name oh, oh yeah pigeon something uh ragtime pigeon ragtime yeah. pigeon you're yeah welcome. yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well uh just so you know we're probably a little over an hour now so okay. if, if you know we need to wrap it up at any point judge, we're, isn't it? we're at but... two hours are we really yeah what? oh wow yeah. really yeah it's there you go. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I guess I guess I, I didn't look at the, the I, first. I one. might have to go to the bathroom. So, <laughs> no, we, actually, we have the same mic. It's in there. Oh, okay. And we have a little. So we we, we could it's seamless. It's so totally could, yeah, seamless. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gonna be amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, we've. Did you have something else? I was just gonna wrap with. We've taken up way too much. Yeah. Of time. I know. It's been a pleasure, and I absolutely amazing. Yeah. I, could, I could go on, but we'll have to do a, a part two if you if you want to come back at some count, point. Count me in. All right. Um, yeah. But this was this was awesome. It was really fun to talk to you both, and um, yeah amazing to uh well it started with my week just going through the different things like i see you often enough i've played with you a bunch but amazing to just see these other things that you've been i'm not surprised right at all uh but it was great to listen to like because when we play together it's it's usually as a rhythm section and it's it could it's it's our vision of what we want something else to be that like you that right. you, that you right. didn't write right so to hear what you write and to hear the stuff with to hear Annie in there because mm. I've only just said hello. I don't. I don't. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think she did the Secret City thing with us, didn't she? She did. 
Did she? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, I think she did. That was just yeah. an amazingly fun. Yeah. The, just the energy of that it was such a beautiful, yeah. chaotic beauty. Like, to yeah, us. like we got the tunes, and, and it, it was yeah. just amazing to to be part of that. Again, the yeah. amazing part of it comes for the, from the audience for me. The feedback. Yeah. Like, if you're in front of 200 people yeah. and they are loving, yes, then you're fe- there's something that there. That's a priceless. Uh, yeah, that's just a. I think that's why we. Um, maybe why we get in the game you know maybe i don't know i i it's, i'm sure it plays a part because yeah. i yeah i can certainly remember well without going off into a whole nother thing but you know i can remember those early experiences of being in front of an audience and going ooh, because I, I was i was like the geeky weird kid that got bullied uh-huh. and then and then suddenly i, I had a bass and i was like i was oh I'm, I'm a rock star You're cool yeah that'll you know, do it yeah it'll do it they love it you yeah. know but it, but it's not just vanity it was like they're having a great time. Yeah. And, and I'm having, having, a, great having time. a great time. So what's not to like, you know? It, it is that simple. Yeah. As complex yeah. as the rest of this gets. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you're having fun, I'm having fun. Yeah. Then that's, yeah. that's the one. Spinal tap, isn't it? <laughs> 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 well, so what is he says? I can't remember. Have a good time all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't remember that quote, but that that's about that. I think it's the keyboard player. I don't know. Yeah, it's the spinal tap thing. Yeah. 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 Well. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. on that note, thank you so much for coming and, mm. and sharing all these incredible Good experiences pleasure. with us. Yeah. Um, is there anything that the listeners should be keeping an eye out for? Anything Projects. that you want to promote? Um, well, I'm working on stuff with all sorts of people. Um, I'm working on some new stuff with Verna. Um, Verna Gillis? Yeah, Verna Gillis, which uh, Jerry's going to play on. And we don't even know what that's going to be yet, but I'm sure it'll be great. It um, is going to be great. Yeah, I'm working on another album finally i got kind of got to it amazing yeah so i'm not quite sure what it's gonna be called but it sort of dovetails with the idea of doing um um a few people have said i write a bit you know i do i do um i do a weekly i'm, I'm just a student i'm like a writing student i guess but dakota who made the film is a writer she's had books published mm-hmm. and um she does a w- weekly writing class and i've been doing that and uh you know annie's uh tony levin comes along sometimes and um you know we just share writing and stuff it's great it's, wow. it's a great fun thing um anyway so long story short a few people have said um there's a company called woodstock arts which is a guy called weston bleelock and he floated the idea to me of like you should do like a show where you kind of maybe talk about your life a bit mm-hmm. But, you know, like, a, I hesitate to say a musical, you know, because that's like, bah! not that, you know, not Ethel Merman. But, um, but like, some stories, you know, some songs. I, I don't know. And I, it's early days, but I feel like that might be shaping up. Oh, wow. You know, to be like, um, a little, yeah, I'm just thinking about it. I'm just, I'm almost by saying that, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, pushing myself along the road yeah, yeah saying okay i'll say it but i do have some ideas and i do have some bits of writing and i maybe in some songs that might fit into that so so the next album could maybe be that there's some spoken stuff on that last album. yeah there is yeah so maybe to take that a little bit further but it's i still i don't really want it to be broadway you know that's not my i mean if it ends up on broadway great because we'll all make loads of money <laughs> yeah but um i i don't think that's the way into it i think it's more of a um, it's more organic than that so. well if it's on broadway i think um ragtime pigeon might be the i um, think that's that's going to be the because you're incorporating yeah. a couple i can see that actually just in those big red well, letters ragtime was a musical right uh Bur- uh not Bur- cats you can tie this in yeah pigeons pigeon, pigeon is a york. popular word yeah They're big in new york but yeah, yeah. You, have, you have pigeons in this country right? oh in new york is probably more it's pigeons than people yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's another title more pigeons than people <laughs> <laughs> just ch- see what happens yeah you know, we're just riffing just you know riffing. yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway yeah well, you've got a place Actually, to promote it. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's say it is going to be a Broadway musical. There you go. I'll affirm that. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So, you know, because that's what you do in this country, right? You pick yourself up. So, um, yeah. vision board. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm writing a Broadway musical. The vision and, um, board's right there, actually. We, yeah. There's nothing on it. Which would nothing explain, on it. That'll explain my vision. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're talking to some backers and, um, we, you know, we're hoping to put on a, a Broadway musical. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, well, called, like um, 
uh, what was it called? Ragtime, 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 ragtime pigeon. 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 Yeah, so, so uh, uh, audience, keep an eye out for ragtime yeah. pigeon. No, maybe the, wood, the Woodstock Whirl. There you go. Uh, the, was, I have a song which I wrote with Julia Blelock. She wrote the words. I wrote the music. It's called the Woodstock Whirl. Okay. That's a nice title. Not Whirling like Dervish. We're no. Not. Okay. No, just the Whirl. Okay. Just the one. <laughs> so it's Woodstock Whirl. The Woodstock Whirl. The Woodstock Whirl. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Well, that sounds amazing. Yeah. We will be on the lookout for all that. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You're awesome. Oh, Seriously. thank you both. Thank you.